You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Oh, yes, we are back. Welcome back, Leatherhead Nation, to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Hank knows it. Pete knows it. It's the only one that brings the firehouse kitchen table right to you, wherever you are, whether you're in uh, Budapest, Hungary, or wherever you are, whether Florida, we bring the firehouse kitchen table to you. Welcome back, fellas. We got my man, senior dude, old man Mole, sitting in for Ruffy. He's got a better view. No uh, really uh, gaudy curtains in the background. Thank you for that, senior <laughs> dude. You got my Lenai doors. I, you yeah. know, I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Hello to all my brothers and sisters out there and Leatherhead Nation. Happy oh. to be here sitting in for my friend Lou. Senior yeah. dude, I just want to tell everybody in the Leatherhead Nation, actually, I was working with a, <laughs> uh, a high-level television producer today, and I showed her our podcast. She loved it. She thought it was a great idea, so on and so forth. She goes, I only have one critique. And I go, what? She goes, it's loose curtains. He's got to get rid of the fucking curtains. <laughs> I shit you not. That's the thing she said. <laughs> you got rid you of them tonight. <laughs> we got rid of them tonight. So there you go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> want to pay we some bills? The, yeah, we gotta pay the bills. I think you gotta do the wonderful voiceover, bro. Uh, well, I think we did. I think we did our other one t- the other night. On Monday night, we did. Oh, yeah, yeah I did. think we did. I think we did. But so, but tonight, however, guys, on the forget, self-proclaimed best firefighter podcast in the world, we have gettingsaltyapparel.com. Oh. Guys, come on, you know the deal. Gettingsaltyapparel.com, where you get wonderful tumblers, this such as this, oh. or awesome Ooh. t-shirts, hats, uh, beverage vessels of all types. You get hoodies, you name it. It's hoodie season. You gotta have a hoodie. Get it from gettingsaltyapparel.com. So, guys, it's the best firefighter apparel and accessories in the game. I Kev, actually, you gotta get me one of those lighters, dude. I want one of those uh Red Rover, Red turn. Rover, come on Red, over. Red Rover, come on over, man. I gotta have one of those bad boys, all right? And uh, yeah, oh, there it is. Wait, oh, is I it? gotta I gotta refill this one. I've been nice. playing with it so much yeah. that uh it blows out the third the third floor, man. I dig it. it. Does. So, guys, if you want to support us and support the show, head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Also, guys, tonight, if you absolutely positively have to have a question answered, shoot it to us in the Super Chat. Um, throw us a little cha-ching. You guys are the number one sponsors of our show. We appreciate everyone who uh, helps us out in the Super Chat, especially me, you guys. This is like... Uh, a job for me, and I really appreciate every little bit of cha-ching that goes that way. So thank you. And guys, like, subscribe, and share. That's the number one way you can help the show. That is it. The more subscribers we have, the more we can uh, promote the show and get it out there. And I can have five five pieces, one a day out for you guys uh, Monday through Friday. And that's the ultimate goal of the show is to entertain you guys. So like, subscribe, and share. Boom. Do it. Don't and today, today's show is also brought to you by Mike Milner because Mike oh, got us this guest tonight. Yep. Uh, but you know what? Before we do that, there's one more thing. <clears throat> What's that? The world school. Oh, that's the old school tip. I mean, the word of the day. No. What? You know, it's more important than all of those things. We have to What's say that? the Pledge of Allegiance, my friends. Oh, we do. You know what it is? I smell smoke in my house, right? <laughs> That's why I'm so you distracted. Do? Yeah. Really? What's the matter? What's going on over there? Is uh, Lu- uh, Luki do, cooking? Do the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, here we go. Oh, my God. All right, guys. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Boom. There it is. All right. Me and Mr. Mole are the uh, the patriotic Americans in here, you know. And then we, we got to find out if I got to transmit to 1075 yet for the box <laughs> over there with Kevin's house. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Noisy McGee. I had to pot yeah. him down over here. Let's see yeah. what's going on. If uh, uh, let's let's hear what's happening in the background. Uh, okay. Let's see what the signal is. Hopefully it's a 10, 8, 10 18 for a 10 26. What do you got going on there? 10 18 for a 10 26. An 18 for a 26. I What's smell up? smoke in the podcast room, but I don't know. The kids say there's nothing going on. They're out there fighting. I don't know what else is going on. But... God bless them. All right. Yeah. Well, now we smoke? have our now we have our special guest. Yes, and it's brought to you by Mike Milner. Hey, thank you, Mikey, oh, for getting Mike. me in touch with uh, Captain Ferry. Hey, he's such a hell of a sweet guy. He's a he's a he's a uh, he's a, such a mashugana. I love him. <laughs> Let's bring him in. He's such a mensch. Let's bring. 
We got a guy who was in squad one, bro, back in the day. Woo. He was an officer in rescue. He was a lieutenant in rescue. He was a uh, captain in the rescue. Woo. Here he is. Let's bring him in, Petey. From behind the curtain, grab him. Captain Ferry. There he is. Love him. Rocking a serious stash there, sir. I love that stash. That's awesome. Welcome to the show, Cap. Appreciate it. I haven't had it off since January 13th, 1979. Right. Last time Come on. <laughs> really? <laughs> You've had yeah, the mustache that long? I shaved it off of probie school and grew it right back. Wow. Well, let me see. So you got it in, in January of 79. When did you get on, Hank? February 79. Oh, so I would say Last after today, Captain Ferry. that you would be Captain Ferry's bop then if uh, you got it. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> no, I don't I'm think just, so. I'm just throwing that out there, Cap. You don't have to say. I think, did, uh, didn't you have my pal Eddie Garrity in your class, John? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, okay. good guy, Eddie Garrity. You didn't have, the, Hank had this guy in his class over here. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, Chief, Chief Steve. Steve. <laughs> yeah, Chief Steve in there. You never had any run-ins with Chief Steve, did you, Cap? No. My brother, Chief Steve, Deputy Chief Steve, Smiley Jones. You know him? <laughs> I don't think I know him, no. What? Wow, doesn't smile much. Great guy, but doesn't smile much. He's no? just like the puppet, actually. He's just like the puppet, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to tell the difference. When, when See, you got to catch some back episodes when I have the puppet and my brother on. It's a great show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, okay, right. well, you got to remember, Captain. For mo most of his career was he started was Brooklyn or else he was special ops. He would have never seen your brother. Oh, uh, they might have crossed paths somewhere. You never know. Yeah. yeah. You know. I mean, he was in uh, two hundred two, and uh, my brother was in eh, two twelve. That's a little too far away. Yeah. But let's let's not take it ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about the uh, Captain Ferry's early days. Uh, what part of the the city are you from originally, Cap? Staten Island, North Shore, of Staten oh. Island. Oh, Staten Island. So was that before or after they built the bridge? <laughs> uh, I was born before they built the bridge. <laughs> you were? Yes, I was. How did you get back and forth to the city then? We took the ferry. Captain Ferry he took the ferry. ferry. <laughs> <laughs> you but see how I set him up on that one? Hey, you saw that? Yeah. That's why I could do this show with this on if I had to hang my man <laughs> skills. So born and bred in Staten Island. What, uh, any family on the job? What makes you want to be a fireman? Uh, the Boy Scouts of America. I meet really? in the Boy Scouts of America mm -hmm. three guys. And the other, the, those three guys, Tom and Dave Jakubowski and Ed Hawkins. Ed Hawkins from 318. Uh, Tom Jakubowski was a 91 guy, and then he did his last 10 years as a fire marshal. And then Dave Jakubowski retired last year as a deputy chief out of the 15th. Yes. Those three guys, uh, we met in the Boy Scouts, and Dave and Tom had a neighbor who was a fireman, and he kept telling us, hey, and we hung out all the time, and we still talked to each other once a month at least. Uh, and that relationship from the Boy Scouts, we met their neighbor, and their neighbor said, hey, you guys got to become firemen, <clears throat> and that's what we did. And like, all, you got, all you took the job and got on the job. Yep. Wow, we all got on within within one year of each other. Yeah. So wow. you did you do you go to Eagle Scout? Negative. Out of the four of us, none of us made Eagle. <laughs> really? My boys are in the Scouts now, pushing hard. To, I, I never knew how important Eagle Scouts were. My my four nephews were all Eagle Scouts, and my sister's like, "You yeah, know, it's a big deal, right?" And I'm like, "Nah, I don't. Know. Is it a big deal? I don't know." But evidently, it is. Resume. <laughs> yeah. Your resume. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So if, instead of Eagle Scouts, you become fireman. You know, <laughs> just I'm wondering, just I'm wondering impressive. if uh, on what? Staten Island they ever had a word of the day over there. I think they do, Pete. What is that word of the day? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I have there's a visual aid to this word of the day. I gave a visual aid just the first, very first time. Captain Ferry is the very first recipient of the, vi of the video word of the day, Pete. Give it, and that is blue thunder. <laughs> Woo! Woo is right. Very nice. I think the captain's drinking a little. What do you got over there, Cap? A little, uh, little scotch. A little scotch. Petey's drinking a little scotch. Hmm. Senior dude, what are you drinking there? Tito's. 
That you know what? Did you put a little tonic in there? A little lime? I did. Too? You know, I like my tonic with my Tito's. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. I followed right your steps. You threw that out there. I jumped right on it. I think mm -hmm. I got a little more Tito's than I have tonic though. So that's all right. <laughs> okay, so Boy Scouts lead you to the fire department. You take the test. You get in 1979. First stop, engine 202. How did that happen? It didn't. <laughs> it did. I didn't know anybody. I don't. Uh, it's kind of funny. My uncle was on the fire department and his captain was John O'Rourke. And when I get on the fire department, John O'Rourke's the, uh, is like a deputy. He's not yet the, he's not yet the fire, uh, the chief. He's the chief of department. I'm sorry. He's wow. the chief of department when I get on. And I don't know his connection to him. So I don't call him and make a deal. <laughs> so he tells you after you're on the job, like, Oh, thanks. You <laughs> could have told me that, yeah. told so, me that before maybe. <laughs> But it worked out for the best. I go to 202 Engine, and it was really well known. <clears throat> it was really well known for its cooks. And I learned right. how to cook there. Those guys all right. cooked all kinds of stuff. So you picked and up a skill. I picked up a skill, and that was one of the skills that I think got me into squad one. I was going to ask you, how do you – It was the, right, Hank? I even said to you, <laughs> right. over the resume, i got to ask him, how do you go to squad one – has nothing to do with that. Your uncle knows the chief of department, but how do you go to squad one? <laughs> squad one well, it looks like less than a year on the job. No, just over a year. Just over a year. Oh, oh, oh okay. How do, you, how do you go to squad one with just over a year on the job? Uh, because a couple of those covering guys uh, on overtime, a couple of guys from squad uh, squad one, the lieutenants. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Kubler came down. And uh, k k k oh, I can see his face. I can't think of k k s Anyway, two of them come down. I cook dinner for them, and they're like, "Wow, you really can cook." But then I also knew Kenny Pogan, who was a chauffeur in Squad One, and I went and talked to him. So he oh. set me up with a res uh, with a uh, an interview with Ray Downey, and the two lieutenants were pulling for me at the same time. So. That's how I got in. They didn't say, hey, you only got a year on the job. Come back. Or the, the fact that you could really cook. Maybe maybe, well, maybe I, you had like five years on. I don't know. Maybe that all set. <laughs> but it happened at, at Squad One when they first opened. Yeah. They got extreme amount of talent in there. Okay. Right. But they also got the senior guys from every company, which means everybody's used to doing it a certain way. Right. And there was some head bumping between guys who wanted it this way and guys who wanted it that way. So some of those senior talented guys left. And in the first year, they dropped about eight people. So guys like Bobby West, me, uh, Charlie Schmidt, uh, Mike Russo. You know, we, we were the guys who, who kind of like just filtered in because those guys were all they, – they had some friction. And that's what happens, they say a lot when you open a new house, that the initial group, there's several guys who just can't connect right. because they all used to be the top dog in their own companies. So – when I got there, I was like, yeah, you're, you're just filling a spot of a guy who just really couldn't fit in with what we were doing. Right. So. What year did they organize there, Cap? So if you got there in uh... – December 3rd, 1978. Oh, wow. So they were really fairly fresh there, man. And, and we, we had uh, Chief LaFamina on. He said at the time, now if I remember correctly, you only had first two boxes and then 1075s. And is that how it worked? Yes. When I was oh, there, that's what we had. We, all we no, had was – was First Sonny Catalo the name you were looking for? Sonny Catalo, yes, Sonny. Right. Yeah, Sonny was a, a big proponent and, for me. Yeah. And you and so so squad one and two oh two that you were all in the same battalion. Then? What was that the three one back division. then? Or? No, it was the same division. So I actually managed to get two details out of out of the battalion into squad one before I actually got 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 up there on an onion skin. All right. Yeah, because I was saying, because 202 wasn't that close to Squad 1. That's why I, didn't, I wasn't sure if it was the same battalion back then, you know? Same division, okay. and, and the battalion was in with us. So the battalion aide called the division and said, hey, if you ever get something up in Squad 1, we got a kid we want to send up there. Gotcha. Oh, so you impressed them early on. You were eager to learn. You liked to go to fires. So what was it like going to see Downey the, when, when you came in for the interview? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm squad one's backing in from a, from a, from a call, and I'm sitting on my car, and I, the car the rig backs up right. I, I get up, I I start to walk across the street. The guys know why I'm there. I've met a few of them already. They all kind of scurry to the back. 
Kenny waves hello to me and walks away. So it's me and Downey at the front bumper, right? And everybody's gone away. And Downey says to me, hey, you know, I hear you want to come to the company. I said, yes, I really do. And, you know, do you want me to fill out any paperwork or do you want me to do something? And he goes, no, no, you're okay. You're the next guy in. But don't, don't tell anybody. <laughs> like that? Don't tell but anybody. Don't tell anybody. That was the, <laughs> but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so I, I said, okay. So I didn't say anything about the conversation. This is probably the first time I've even talked about the conversation because he said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so uh, uh, 40, but, 50, 40 years deal. later. <laughs> Downey made the deal. Downey opened squad one with the deal being he'd get rescue two when the spot opened. Ah. So he leaves. He leaves. Bef and before you get there, you mean? Yes. And what happens is uh, uh, Ditta, Charlie Ditta becomes the captain. And he calls me on the phone. It's like a Friday night. And he says, okay, Ray says you're the next guy in the company. You're going to get, you're going to come over here on an onion skin, but you better not tell anybody. Another one. <laughs> so I, I, again, I'm like, okay, I will say anything to anybody. I, I'm just, I still haven't said anything. Any of my friends have heard this about anything. So I, I hang up the phone. Okay. Sunday night, I had work on Sunday night, and the captain calls me up to the office. Hey, you know anything about this? No, nope, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it, Cap. He goes, you're going to squad one tomorrow. Okay, okay. Do you know anything about this? No, not anything. No, nothing. <laughs> That's how I handle the guy it. Can, the guy can see, keep a secret. Look, we just broke a story here on getting salty experience, bro. We, we just know broke the story. Story. Forty years later, <laughs> right? We just but, broke the story, Hank. You know what, what? When John, when the captain interviewed with with the, you know, what became your know, chief daddy when he was the captain, then he he, I don't, he really hadn't achieved God status. Then he was like one of the maybe like a leading apostle. And, you know, so it probably wasn't as intimidating as it would have been a, a few years down the road, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That still had to be intimidating, especially he only had a year on coming from yeah, 202. Yeah, right. yeah, man. <laughs> what lieutenants were there when you got there, Cap? Uh, Cataldo. Sonny right. Cataldo. Uh, I was Cleehouse there? Or was Cleehouse? Cooper was there. Uh, the captain was Ditta, and he had just brought in Lieutenant Lindsay. <clears throat> so you caught quite a bit of work there, I could assume, in those years there. Those first four years there were like nothing else in my career. They were really like, the first four to five years. You, the first, like the first year was like I say this to people, and they, 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 they can't believe it. But the first year, we'd go in on a night tour, and we'd leave the firehouse and not come back for like hours we'd go from one fire to another and on day tours we were always guaranteed to get to get to at least one fire it was just it was just a really unique time now did they how much of the borough did they cover were they covering the entire borough at the time no. or no what we just had certain, uh, certain divisions of battalions 10 battalions 10 battalions basically from bay ridge oh uh, just past the the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, and and then out to uh, uh, just shy of Coney Island, and then a curving all the way back around. So we like, go were you going up to? Uh, I was gonna say East New York. What about like one eleven, one twenty three? Yeah, one eleven. Yeah, we ran it with them a lot. Wow, yeah, I was in one thirty two. You know, we used to see yeah. Squad One all the time. You know, they'd come in the three eight battalion. Yeah, catch a lot of good work over there. So how was it in the early days with Rescue 2? Was there any bumping heads with them or, uh, you know? <laughs> well, the, I think what happened was two things happened. At that, though for those four, four or five years, Rescue 2 hadn't moved yet. They were still still in downtown Brooklyn. 210. So we were always four or five miles ahead of them, so to speak, right. going someplace. And so we, we had that kind of advantage. And then the other thing was Ray Downing, when he set the company up, he set it up to respond as a squad. And he came up with terms and names that weren't used in the past. So he invented squad one and he invented a, a unit that when they got in, the chief would know what they would do. And it, it he actually kind of, <laughs> kind of set up a, 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 a rival company that functioned very well because of how he set it up. Right. Now, what positions did they have, similar to what they have in the rescues and the squads now, or how did you guys operate? Well, at that time, we operated with, we had uh, 
uh, five floor team would be the officer, Irons and Can. Uh, then we had uh, our outside guy was called instead of the OVM, we call him Squad Remote. And then we had Roof and a chauffeur. But those three could operate as another whole team if they wanted to. Again, like we understand when we pull up, we're looking at whatever gaps might exist where we can help people. You know, right. they need more people pulling ceilings. We'll go do that. You know, right. whatever it was. So it wasn't. It was. It was nice in a sense that, you know, we we got to some places and we got, we could help make a difference. Help guys get it done. I mean, your second and third do boxes. <laughs> You probably guys could have probably stretched the line when you got in there. No, I mean you're that close there. No, 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 no. Squad no stretching every line was. We had, we had, I think we had 16 or 18 first two boxes, and then after that right. we do the squad. So yeah, that's it. Now, now I think it's changed. Now I believe it's they have second and third two boxes. Yeah, we had second and third two boxes. Yeah, no, no doubt. But uh, you guys yeah. had to get in quick. That I mean, if you're normally second do, now you're coming in, you probably could be the second do or maybe even the first do truck, right? To, to second do engine boxes that you would have had? Well, yes and no, because then we wouldn't have been the squad. We would have been second do engine and third do engine. Yeah, but you didn't have second and third do boxes, right? Right, right. But we didn't so, go until the 1075. And as oh, well, right, right, right. Some right. companies, some companies, you know, they hold that 1075 until they get a little bit of everybody in place a little bit, you know? <laughs> Oh, that might have been, been a, by, you know? that might have been the squad one fucking. <laughs> That's what they <laughs> called it, <laughs> right, Hank? Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I got to say, John, I, you made me smile with that when you when you were saying the positions when you said squad remote. Because I haven't heard that in years, years. But like I said, when I was in Brooklyn and you guys would come in, you know, I'm thinking of the old, you know, on the radio transmissions. You know, it's at one point you'd always be hearing squad remote, and that was the only, you know, the only time you ever heard that as a position. Yeah. Yep. So uh, a little nostalgia for me. I, so put a smile on my face. Thanks. There you go. We might not see another smile for months. So thank you very much, Cap. <laughs> but with the wages you're paying, I'm the, exactly oh. the reason to smile. <laughs> wages, wages, Pete. <laughs> Hold on, a minute. I gotta throw out that blue thunder for that one, Pete. Blue thunder. Oh. Blue thunder. Oh. Nice, you guys. Wow. Cheers. What other guys were there? Did you work with Freddie Lafamina when he was there? Or who else did you work with? Who were some of the names you could throw out there? Uh, Freddie came after me. Uh, let me think of some of the other guys that were there. Uh, Charlie Casper. He was the one. Kevin Williams. Kevin, Kevin Williams. Williams. Oh. Yep, Kevin. Uh, God, it, the list is pretty. Uh, that's a pretty deep list you got there. How about fella. Eddie, Eddie Morrow? Uh, let me think some of the other guys. Uh, Do you have Ken, oh, Kevin Ken. Adele? Was Kenny Kasman and Eddie Morrow there? Yep, Kenny Kasman, Eddie Morrow, yep. Uh, God, was now, uh, did you – I mean, you guys were basically a fire company, right? You didn't have any – did you carry any of the other tools? Like, did you have a hearse tool or any other stuff that the rescues might have had? Or basically, you guys were just going to fires? Well. Well, we had a, a complement of truck tools. We would carry uh, two saws, uh -huh. so we had a metal saw and a and a wood cutting saw, and we had a. Uh, eventually, they got more tools when they got the tack, uh, the the second the, the second hazmat piece. They got some more tools put on that, but right. in, in general, they have they do have all the uh, now they have all the rope stuff. Uh, they, yeah, we they had that. Tools. We had that too. Back then, back no. Then. I'm sorry. Back then, right. no. Back, back then, then, it was basically we rocked. Fires. We rolled up with we rolled up with truck tools on our hands, and we got told go go stretch a line. We dropped everything and went and got a line. Right. Well, that, yeah, that all changed in '98 when the other squads came online yeah. and, and they standardized everything. You know. Right. But I was wondering, back in the day, Hank, did they did they operate as a rescue too with those some of those tools and some of that training, or they were just basically there for fire duty? I mean, I, I always kind of remembered you, the squad one is just like running for flyers all the time. You yeah, know, right. mostly flyers, 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 you know, which is not not a bad thing, you know. <laughs> no. Busy. Especially but, if yeah. you only had first two boxes, man. Forget yeah. it. But, I mean, like if it was a confined space job, I don't know. Did you go on? Like, I don't know whether you even had the equipment for that stuff back then, Cap. Did you, like, high angle? Well, uh, I know you didn't have high uh, High angle rope didn't really come into the job until later. I know when yeah, I, was I was in one, we went right. to evaluate it like in '88 or '89 right. or something. Right. So the, that's that's and because uh, yeah, we got sent to, to actually to the Nassau County Fire Academy to go to a Roco class to evaluate 
uh, they sent me, Paul Hashagan, and Ronnie Buka. And, uh, and then after that, and we gave it the thumbs up, that's when everybody, you know, we started getting into the high angle rope stuff. But, uh, yeah, I just hey. remember the squad one is going to fires all the time yeah. and operating, as, you know. Oh, that's terrible. We, that's hard. I don't know if I can I handle remember, it. I remember a couple, like a few collapses getting sent to them and just being part of, like, part of the search crew. I remember one collapse we went to, we, uh, <laughs> with Charlie Casper, we actually started tunneling up from the bottom. Uh, but, yeah. We, fire duty, fire duty, fire duty. <laughs> More, yeah, more of that. Yeah. Were you in? Were you in Squad One when when Captain Staines was there? Eddie Staines. I I was leaving as he got there. Okay, so bef right. but before right, before you I, get, I left, right. I left as he got. Yeah, he was getting there. Okay, yeah. but be before you get, before you move him on to the next company, I got a, I got a funny Eddie Staines story for you. Yeah, I'm not going to move on yet right. because I want to ask him too. When about what time? I don't know. I think uh, who's in the chat? Stevie Gillespie's in it. When did Forty One? Kind of follow suit with you guys and start doing the same type of thing. Do you know when that was roughly? Was it? Uh, it, well, yeah. it, was, it was like three or four years before I left. I know that. And yeah. I, I remember a couple of guys went up there. Charlie Charlie Schmidt went up. Uh, Al Lampasso went up for a little bit when they opened up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, they had to be doing a shit ton of work too, man. Oh, they yeah. When, they, when they, they, yeah. When, as soon as they went online, the, because of the need in that area, they the, the fire duty surpassed ours. But wasn't, really? that a, wasn't that a tough transition? Like where you where you guys was was two sixty nine, and they they made it squad one, right? And right. I, I, you know, I don't know where the guys came and left, but I know I think when forty one was started, and like half the guys stayed, and then a new a new group came in. You know, there was there was a lot of friction because you know you got. 41 was no we do it this way and then you had half the company well now we're going to do it this way which you know i mean there's growing pains there but i, I don't think i don't know if squad one went through that as bad as 40. No. what happened when the squad one was after the fiscal when the fiscal crisis hit they closed engine 269. so the the community board there kept fighting and fighting to get their unit back so the, the fire department said yeah we're going to put a unit in there and they actually got a, the guy that was doing it uh, at George. He he was always keeping an eye on things in the neighborhood. That guy and Rescue Two went over there and eyed up the building to see if they could get in. <laughs> and he seen him there. He gets on the phone right away and he says, "Whatever you're going to put in 269, better have a set of pumps on it." And then that's how Squad One got stuck. Out. Look at that! Another breaking story here. On we're breaking stories all over the place tonight. <laughs> I, know, I, I thought I didn't remember that, but it was 269. I put that somewhere <laughs> in my head, but that was engine 269. And they closed it, right? And then they reopened uh, as a, well, as a, well, a well, yeah. so You know what? Where, where, where 269 was, that was kind of like an oasis. That was still a pretty – at the time, it was an affluent area compared to the surrounding yeah. areas. Yeah. So, like, like, you actually had a supermarket that you could shop in and you could park your cars. You didn't have to worry as much. And then it's you know, but when you you'd run a few blocks either way, you, you know, you were getting out of that nice area. But yeah. I think the community group there had a lot of weight, so that's why like you're not taking our engine. You know, George Lovegreen. Line. George Lovegreen. That was the guy's okay. name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and to, to add on to that, 269 did a lot of relocations because they, they were in such an ideal spot. They could run run up to Grand Army Plaza, go right, go east, go north, go south, go north. It was they had a really good spot in that that sense. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, run along the park. It could be down in yeah, Flatbush. Park, uh, drop down to Fourth know. Avenue. Yeah. They, they relocated them a lot from what mm -hmm. I from what it historically was explained to me. Right. Hey, Pete, somebody put it in the super chat. They wanted to know if uh, if Cap knew uh, a couple of guys here. From Baltimore or something? Uh, Baltimore. It was uh, that, uh, Leroy and Dave Batters from Baltimore County, Maryland uh, are in the chat. Or in the chat. Yeah. And that, thanks, uh, are they on, Lee and Dave? Yep. Yeah, they're in the chat. Yep. Well, uh, yes, I know them. They're really great guys. Wow. It's been a long time, guys. Long time. Uh, I think the last time I seen them was a couple months after 9 11. I don't think I've seen them since then, but yeah. Wow. A couple a couple huh. good guys. What um what I was gonna say, how how was it with uh, running with some of those busy trucks? 111, 123. You have you guys bumping any heads there, or was it uh everybody kind of played along, you know? 
I I don't think we I don't think this the squad had issues with other companies because <laughs> we come in and try to help you. I'll help you pull ceilings. I'll help you do this. You know, whatever you want. You want me to want me to cut a hole? I'll cut a hole. But I think uh, there, there was another unit that might have had some uh, some issues with some of the other companies. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, you're coughing, huh, Hank? <laughs> what? What was your story? I, I witnessed a few of those scenes. I, I, I uh, oh, Hank, the, the longtime captain of 132. Uh, Joe Bruzo. Yes, Uncle Joe. Uh, I remember Joe getting mad one night at somebody from from a from a rescue company, and man, I was like, first of all, I was like. Wow, he's really yelling at that guy. And then the next thing I know is everybody is like coming out of the woodwork. Like, like he's yelling, but they're pushing him back as I'm pushing towards. That's like, uh, this is this is getting out of hand. But nobody, no, nobody, nobody got hit. Nobody got punched. But it was uh, he got upset, and he was pretty cool, calm, cool, calm guy. You know, he was well, calm. at that point too. You know, a lot of the guys had, <clears throat> that were in two, a few, you know, had come from one thirty-two. You know, Lieutenant Vigiano was in one thirty-two. Went he went to two. And then you had uh, 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 Richie Evers, Al Steinhardt, you know, some of the you know, more you know, senior guys or they became senior guys. So, you know, it was kind of a love-hate relationship. You know, it was, you know, you used to play on the same team. Now you're you're in the same division, but you're on opposing teams. So, uh, yeah, so sometimes it got heated. But like you said, it really, it, I, I really didn't see anybody come to blows, you know. Everyone kind of let each other know how they felt, and then it was kind of like <clears> the <throat> end of it. Yeah, what so. was that story you wanted to tell Hank about <clears throat> Squad One? Oh, with, with, uh, so I'm I'm uh, I'm working a night tour in uh, Rescue One, and uh, Captain Staines, Eddie Staines from Squad One, was working overtime. So we're at the dinner table. And everybody's just you know a typical firehouse kitchen. Everybody's bullshitting, and and somehow I don't know, something about the military. Who had anybody have military time or something? So um, Captain Staines says, "Yeah, you know, I was he was old, you know older than us. A lot of us." Um, Hadn't done military time. We just had missed Nam. And then it was like, all right, the next step. And all right, we're going into the fire department. <clears throat> but he ended up, um, he said when the time came before the fire department, he was he, he was tossing in his head. He knew he wanted to go in the military. And it was between the Army and the Navy. <clears throat> and he was back and forth, back and forth. And he said, I joined. He said, you know what? I joined the Navy. He said, and it wasn't until I was in the Navy for uh, you know a few days that I realized I made the wrong decision. Oh boy! And we said, you know, Cap, why was that? He said, Well, when you, when you're the uh, new guy in the, uh, you know, in the Navy, you're a seaman. So he said, I was seaman stains. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I always stains. remember that story of Captain Stains at the dinner table. Yeah, that story. Of Crash and uh, burn. Oh good. my goodness gracious! So uh, like the army would have pr private stains sounded a lot better than Stevens stains. stains. <laughs> <laughs> private stains. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of private stains myself. That's another <laughs> oh. story. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well. No semen stains, though. That's uh, the well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, semen, stains. Yeah. Yeah. semen stains. Semen stains. Here's to you. Depends what uh, joggers you're wearing. That. That's Blue Thunder for semen stains. Hey. <laughs> Cheers, boys. Oh, I got to reload. <laughs> Oh. All right, so you spent a good amount of time there. You're there for what? Almost uh, eight or nine years? Eight, yeah. eight years, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Ah, you must have seen a, quite a, a good amount of fire duty there, my friend. Um, and then you decide to, for whatever reason, study, and you get promoted. Um, but it doesn't look like you bounced too 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 long there. You, you got promoted in '88, uh, and you went right to rescue five in '89. Huh. How did that happen, Hank? <laughs> well, you know what Louis would be saying. Oh, 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 oh I never done this before. Oh. <laughs> okay, so there's actually an interesting the picture story. with the hot dogs. Uh, there, Pete, yeah, you know? I don't have that one, but yes, we all know. The so there's a real one. story behind this. You got to root it for us. All right, get oh no, there's a real story behind it. Right. Bring, it. Bring it, bring okay. it. All right. Uh, so, uh. Oh gosh, another name just ran out of my head. Uh, oh, what God. company? Uh, Bata Battalion Chief uh, was the former Captain Rescue Three. 
Hmm. Ryan? No. Uh, former captain of rescue. Just uh, hmm. see. Uh, I can't believe I can't remember his name. I, and I actually call him like a couple times a year for help. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a brain cramp myself. I will say Chief C. All right. He he he. He's the he, he owns and he's the editor of, of uh, FAJ. Fire Apparatus Journal. Okay. Mm. Call somebody, 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 I'm Jack sure somebody in the chat knows who it is. So Jack Calderon. Oh, Jack, somebody does Jack know. Calderon. Somebody just uh, three guy, a uh, four guys just said Calderon. Calderon. <laughs> oh, shut up. Okay. Jack okay. Calderon. All right. AK Jack Calderon said. was a lieutenant <clears throat> in Squad One, so he's one of my lieutenants. He leaves Squad One when they open up Rescue Five in '84. <laughs> so he he. He goes to he goes to rescue five. He gets promoted to captain. When he gets promoted to captain, I'm covering in the first division. And in the first division, I'm I'm working in eleven and twenty eight. I'm in the engine this night, okay. And eleven and twenty eight, the guys say, "Hey, I thought you were one of those guys in sock, you know this, and you got you know you got to go work in the rescues." And hey, you know you know we heard sock is doing this, and we heard Norman's doing. How come? What what's with you? How come they don't seem to use you? I said, "No, no, it's all fair. Everybody gets a chance." Next morning, I get up, I drive out to the one seventy four, and I talk to uh, Duffy, and I walk in, and I seem to be the guy that just solved the problem, and I don't know this. They're like happy to see me. I leave and they say, make sure we have your right phone number. I get home, the phone's ringing. And it, it was uh, Pete, uh, who was on light duty, a lieutenant from Rescue One, uh, Lindbergh. He's, oh, yeah, he, was right. the, uh, he was calling me because he was light duty. So he calls me and he says, hey, John, uh, you're going to go UFO to Rescue Five. I said, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Hang up the phone. Why is this happening? So I called Jack because I know he's there. He goes, oh, I just got promoted. I said, well, I'm kind of surprised I'm going to UFO. He goes, oh, two deputy chief sons are fighting over the spot. So rather than make a decision, they're going to put me there. <laughs> they used you. <laughs> and you put me there. And I, I outlasted everybody, and I got the spot. Right place, right time. Yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, Tony Lindbergh was the was, – uh, Tony, Tony. I'm Tony sorry. Lindbergh, Tony. Right. Yes. All right. Well, now, Rescue 5 only came about in 1984. Is that what you said? Well – it, it, it existed before that. It used to be a second section to ladder 78. And they, they actually built the apparatus themselves and, and borrowed and stole tools to fix it up. But before the city was willing to man it, like full time as a, as a rescue company, they closed it in 61, I believe. 61 or somewhere in the early 60s, they closed it. And because they didn't want to fully man it, they were getting pushed to man it. So they, they closed it all together. And... The borough president at that time, uh, Molinari, he was pushing all the time to get a rescue company on Staten Island. So that was on his agenda. And politically, that's he finally got the rescue company open. It opened up in 84. So from 61 to 84, they had no rescue in there. Rescue or 2 any, would come. Rescue 2 rescue would come. 2 would come across, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Right. <clears throat> but didn't they actually, like, really get up and running, like, in 85 – Around 85, because I know right. in 86, when I went to rescue one, you know, we already had to be, you know, dive certified, you know, open water. But myself and Jimmy Elson, who was going to one as a lieutenant, ended up, we had to jump into class because all of rescue five, the whole company get trained. Yep. was getting trained um, by Walt Hendricks, that guy, you know, uh, the guy that was the ex Navy SEAL that had his own <laughs> business there. So, so that, yeah, I said myself and Jimmy Ellison, and I might have been, I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Ronnie Booker too. And we all had to jump in with Rescue Five at that point when, uh, and that's like you said, because they were bringing them up and getting getting them up to speed. Was, was Driscoll a captain, the first captain Driscoll, of uh, Driscoll was the original captain, yes. Okay. And who else, where did they get other guys from coming, guys from, you know, res any other guys from like Rescue Two or anybody who lived in Staten Island that wanted to come there? Who, who went to Rescue Five as a, as a charter member? Uh, we got a, uh, John Thomas from two went there, I believe. Uh, he, uh, uh, a guy from three, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. Big guy begins with a K Craig Krieger, <clears throat> George, George, <laughs> yes, but th th there's only a couple of guys that uh, uh, after that, they took guys, uh, from, from senior yeah. guys from other companies. You know? There was a senior guy there. I remember, uh, Freddie Gottschalk. Yes. 
Hey guys, hey guys. I, I, so I what do they do? Take know. guys from trucks, Hank? What they do? Uh, I think you know. Yeah, I think they were looking for you know some guys with seniority. Um, you know, and obviously the first thing is they reach out to other, like you say, other special ops companies. You know, maybe you know, like I'm sure the guys that that ended up in five from the other rescues probably lived on Staten Island. Yeah, that's right. They said, okay, you know, now I can save the commute, the bridge toll, and I'm still in a rescue company. So you, you know, you, you got them, and then you know, you got a couple other senior guys, and just like just like when we started the squads, you know, and you built you built around that. Okay. Right. Yeah, like you were saying before, there were some guys who just didn't fit right when we started. Right. I mean, you had a whole cast of different, especially us. We only had one guy that stayed, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, there's one. There was one guy in particular who was a little hard to get used to. You know what I'm saying, uh, Cap? <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. Okay. I like him. <laughs> My word. <laughs> yeah. All right, Blue Thunder. I'm saying it. Hey. <laughs> there we go, Blue Thunder. All right. All right. So you go there now as a lieutenant of Rescue Five. Uh, before we go to that, did you have any interesting job in Squad One that you wanted to talk about? Any scary fire stories mm -hmm. that you want to share? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> John, were you in squad one in 1980? Did, had you gotten to one in 1980 yet or no? Yep. April of 80, you got there. Did you have the Sackett Street fire? Sat fifth and Sackett, the one where the mother and her five kids died? Because uh, you guys would have been like on a box, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't recall. Okay. Because that was... I know that was my first fatal fire. I was in 280, and I know Squad One was there. I just didn't know if you were working, because that was a pretty uh, horrendous fire. But I guess not. No. So we won't talk about that one. <laughs> no, this is not a show about Hank, so we'll talk. About That's what I said we won't talk about that one. <laughs> according to Steely, it's definitely not a show about Hank. According to Steely. <laughs> well, listen, if we had it, if we had to depend on you to talk about your flyers, that would end in about three minutes. So you know. You talking to, are you talking to me? Yeah. You I'm not to, hey, listen. Hank, Ray is the one in there saying Hank is like a rock in your shoe on a long hike. <laughs> <laughs> a pebble in your shoe on a 10-mile hike. I know, right? <laughs> this fucking listen, guy. No, <laughs> Son of a bitch. So whatever fire I wasn't going to was a fire you weren't going to. That either, there, my friend. <laughs> it, took him a, it took him a long enough time to start pounding me. I, you know, I don't know. Know. He could have been. I just happened to catch that one out of the corner of my eye, bro. <laughs> Uh, All right, so you got no, you have no uh, memorable fires that you went to in Squad One that, you, that they're in the fourth, or maybe you went to so many that they all just blend into each other. You know, I that's kind of an issue I have about my career. Uh, uh, and and I've talked to somebody about this, before. so uh, yeah, I I don't remember a lot because it it was kind of a repetitious. It was kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, you, you do something so many times. It kind of blends, but I, I can I remember a few that really stand out. Okay, uh -huh. uh, I remember this one fire. Uh, it was actually outside our, our normal district. It was way out the end of East New York, and they sent us because two wasn't available. They were someplace else, so they sent us, and we're driving and driving and driving and driving, and we get there, and it's this big four-story wood frame, and it's got adjoining buildings next to it, and we get there, and the chief says. I got three and two in the building. They're on the top, upper floors, and they can't find the fire, and it's getting hotter. So you can go find the fire. So a few guys take off, and I, I had the remote position that night, and I walk. They're ahead of me, and I, I stop at the first floor, and I turn, and I see this puff of smoke come out the door. Hmm. So I, I start yelling, hey, <laughs> we got to get a line. So I run back out, and the nearest pump is like a half a block away. <clears throat> so I, I run down the street, and I, I get some fire. The guy, and that's when we still didn't have like radios for all our positions. So I tell him, listen, when I get in front of the building, just just charge the line. Just see me get to the front. Don't worry. I'm pulling a hose. I think I'm a pretty strong guy. I get about halfway, and I, this is what really I really remember about one of the things that happened at this fight is – I had to yell to the like this bunch of civilians that hey guys grab the hose, <laughs> pull the hose. So everybody can on the street and they'll help me pull the hose down to the front of the fire building. So I get in front of the building and I, I tell one guy, I'm sure you tell him to charge the line. And I go in and uh 
Bobby West and Mike Russo meet me at the door. Uh, the chauffeur from the first two company pops the door for us. And uh, Bobby West takes the line. I back him up. We go in. Uh, Mike goes to the right, search, makes a search, comes back to us. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Bobby's ears are burning. He gets behind me. I take the line. And turns out that the center room is just roaring and it's going straight up. And they said, they said when we opened it, when we got through the wall, we punched the wall and started knocking it down. They said the flames were just blowing out the front. So it was really, crazy. yeah. So that's Bobby, I remember. <clears throat> Bobby West was the first guy I ever met in squad one when I was in 210. He came to the drill with us. I just remember him. And I ran into him a couple of times after that. And he worked for, uh, I think he works for Morning Pride, right? Yes, now? he does. Yeah. Yep. He worked uh, at Morning Pride, was the same company my wife worked for, so I used to see him at all the trade shows. But it was just so funny how I was a pro being. He came with Squad One. I was like, in awe of Bobby West. I was like, oh, look at this guy, man, Squad One. I want to go to Squad today, man. It's cool. And that's the rest of history. Bobby is Mr. Cool. There's no doubt about that. He really is. Like he's, I used to see him, too, outside of – because we had a lot of projects over there. I'd see him outside talking to Rescue One. I'm like, there's that guy again, man. He looks really cool. <laughs> you know, he's had a cool look about him. <laughs> and surfer now he's guy. Uh, a – guy. A surfer guy. Now he's got, he's a real old dude like me with young kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got to get Bobby on the show. I got to get him on the show. All right. So let's go back to Rescue 5. <clears throat> You're a lieutenant in Rescue 5. Any uh, interesting jobs that you had as a lieutenant there? Was that uh, Pete? Throw up some pictures from SQ Five, brother. Of course. Well, first hey, you got all, that uh, the ship fire thing. Oh, let's go for the barge first. Was that right? when you were a lieutenant? I thought you were a captain and not a lieutenant. No, I was a lieutenant for the barge fire. Oh, I let's bring that up. Tell us about that one. Yeah, tell us all about this. This so is interesting. That's taken from the window of the firefighter, the fireboat, the firefighter, the firefighter one, mm -hmm. and that's as we were approaching. This is a cold February morning, and the back end of that thing is in uh, all ice. Uh, that barge. Uh, they had just taken off gasoline, and they took on uh, diesel, but they they don't vacuum those 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 apparatuses out when they do that. So the fumes were all lifted to the top, the gasoline fumes, and as they pulled away from the dock, they started doing hot work, and they hadn't put the flame arresters back on. So a spark went in, lit this thing off. Ooh. That boom, that first boom broke windows on on the shore of Staten Island. Wow! And, uh, yeah, and they, how many guys on the barge died? Those guys on the barge died. Nobody or? on the barge died. Those two guys, when that thing went boom. They got thrown in the water, and then the, the it's actually a a, a self propelled barge. There's a uh, there's a motor house in the back. You can see that motor house up in the back, the wheelhouse. Uh -huh. so, so that particular barge can maneuver itself. Uh, and every everybody bailed off the barge. Wow! They got off. Yeah, I think so there's the first, uh, other first, pictures, Pete. Yeah, there's one, one more right here. Hold on, one. So second. you guys, where, so you're at Rescue Five. Where do you guys pick up that barge, that boat? I mean, the, where do you meet the fire boat? So we get on. We 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 went to the Con Edison Pier on Staten Island. It's it's in the kill. It's on the uh, off the kill, and mm -hmm. we 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 flag down a with a marine radio. We flag down a tugboat, the Dragon Lady, and the Dragon Lady came alongside, picked us up, and they took us out midstream, and then they boarded us onto the firefighter. Hmm. Fireboat firefighter, right? Uh, Marine nine, and uh, this is as we're coming up. We're, we're, now we're going to come up. And we're going to tie off to that bullet right in front of it. Firefighter one couldn't pump and propel at this uh, propel itself at the same time, so you have to tie up. And then once we had that tie tied up, then we could start pouring. We cooled the decks down for about 15 20 minutes before we went on with foam lines. Wow, they carry the foam or all the time. Those the, the fire they, uh, the firefighter has like uh, probably 10, 15, 55 gallon drums of foam on the on the bow. Oh wow! He pull up yeah. one up. There's a picture of them with the on the not with the nozzle on with foam. With foam, yep. I got the foam one. Stand. So, yeah, that's, that's okay. Hey, so, you know. I'm, you can't see me. I'm the guy in the front. Uh, that's Larry Nelson on the on the uh, on the nozzle. The guy that you can see really clear is Jim Jimmy Talento, and I'm really happy we had him with us that day. He was in the Navy, and he's the guy who actually knew how to tie the boat up to the to the uh, barge. Oh, he jumped shit. in the barge and tied us up so we could pull the decks down. Ah, oh, see that? That's why sock guys have many skills, right, Hank? Right, Henry Mole? That is correct. Yeah, many skills. Look at that. <laughs> I would have. I believe the firefighter, which was the, I think that was the largest 
boat in the fleet at that time, right? Yes, and, it was. And that it could uh, that could out pump the super pumper. I think like two to one. Oh yeah, really? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's cool. yeah mm -hmm. for sure. The, uh, what a crazy the other show. thing is that it's such an old ship. That I, I'm surprised it didn't really get into a museum. But if you went down into the uh, the engine room, that the, they had they had valves on there. That had the Nazi stickers. Oh, on. somebody else did tell me that. I, I told you they had the swastika oh, stickers did. on. Yeah. Stickers, yeah. No way. Yep. Yeah. Oh, this is a this is a news breaking show tonight, fellas. We got a <laughs> lot of info coming out here. Look at that. I'm gonna call my old blue thunder right here. I don't care. Hey. hey. One last one here. Hey. You didn't say one last one, did you? This Zivkovic. For me. Yeah. Oh, the, the other thing, Ooh. when you went when you went below decks on those fireboats, they, they were spotless. Those guys, the wipers and stuff, they used to wow. keep those things yeah. in you know pris I mean, for for the the age of those things, they would really keep them in good shape. They had a lot of pride in uh, in their boats and uh, you know keeping everything in top shape. Yeah, we so, should do a show one time on the fireboats, man. We really should. Interesting when stuff. I, when when I was down to the firefighter a few times on overtime, the uh, when it was still in in the St. George terminal before they moved it over to the Navy Navy Pier, they uh, the the pilots, the pilot and the two the the, the marine the, the wiper and the marine engineer they slept on the boat. Really, they slept on the boat and on the firefighter in the in the in the wheelhouse there was a a, a map table and next to the map table was a, a bed, so you could lay in bed and you had a you had this unobstructed view. Of New York Harbor, like the whole the whole skyline in front of you. Yeah, what did you do in the winter? Though you had to freeze your ass off. I'm sure they had heat, but you keep that yeah, thing no, running. They have, they have plenty of heat on that thing. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> you ever work on the boat tank? I never worked. No, I never worked on it. But I mean, when I was in one, we would, uh, you know, we were on the boats a few times. You know, they would take you out. You really, you didn't dive too much off them, but every once in a while, you needed, you needed. That was the only way to get to, you know, your objective. Um, same but thing with the Coast Guard. Did you have work at tour in, in the boats? Uh, no, because they, no, they, they, I don't think they brought the boats. And, and I don't know, John, maybe you know, but uh, it might have been after 98 when we were in, you know, the squads is when they brought everybody into, everybody into one umbrella. The Marine division was a separate division, and that's what it was the Marine division. And uh, and then by the you know, by the time we were you know, in the uh, sock there. You know, and, and I was your senior dude. It wasn't like I was getting the detail or anything. So I, I never really ended up working. Like I said, been on the boats a few times. Actually worked a uh, overtime tour uh, as a diver when they when they had the tall ships come in on the uh -huh. firefighter too, the smaller one, which was a great I got you know a great view of the Gucci fireworks. But that was the only time <laughs> I ever spent a tour on the flyer boat as a you know as a diver. I mean, think about what it was like in the early days of just the rescues and maybe Squad mm -hmm. One. To what they have today, with the the eight squads now, right? The rescues, hazmat, marine company, hazmat tech units. I mean, it's just the, the, the tech companies, units, right? right. The tech units, the tech uh, units, the, uh, units. The, the support thing. units. Yeah, I mean, it's huge yeah. now, right? How, I mean, I mean, everything, even the thaw the thawing apparatus is part of SOC yeah. now, right? Isn't that? And yeah. I think on the yeah. Spanish, the island, you know, all of that stuff is on the. On the side. It's amazing what the and it's would you really say that, that that Downey was instrumental in, in setting it in that direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think two guys. I because I, I don't want to. Downey was an empire builder. There's no doubt about that. But Jack Fanning also was a guy who could who saw and and helped push the envelope in terms of budget <clears throat> and money about hazmat and hazmat a lot, yes. stuff. So, right. Yeah, the two. I think the two of them, in conjunction, really built this empire. Yeah, right. And you know, it's so funny too. Me and Lou used to say it all the time. Like when we met Fanning, he was just the, you know, the chief in hazmat. But you have no idea where this guy worked before that, right? Because you automatically assume, oh, he's in hazmat. Where could he have worked? And then you look at where the guys worked, and you're like, holy shit, what an idiot I was. You know, like guy was in the best places um, it, during the busy years, right? I mean, he was a captain at 332 when they were knocking him dead, you know. And with, with, I think um, he was in 26 truck too, right? As a fireman, I don't know 
From I am a lieutenant, but yeah, he was all busy places. Yeah, yeah, he's the one who got me over to 288. I tell that story all the time. Somebody made a phone call to him, and like that, I got the you know, yeah. I, I was over there, so I owe a lot to Jack Fanning, no doubt. Yes. Yeah, but those two, and also, I think the uh, the idea of the squads was was uh, Ellison Sr., right? Wasn't that his brainchild, Captain Ellison Sr., I believe. I don't know. I couldn't. I can't. I can't, cannot confirm or deny that. I believe, if I remember, what Captain Murphy said was that he brought that idea to Von Essen, and Von Essen okay. was all for well, it. Man. He was. He, wasn't he one of the guys that was at the Rock when everybody was like doing the tryouts and stuff with his clipboard? <laughs> yeah, I think he might have been one of the guys there. So that that might yeah. play into what you're saying. That yeah, yeah. He, he, he I, I believe been. that whole idea was his. I'll have to check that and get back to you guys. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't have. I don't want to throw bad information out there. You know, Hank. We'll go with that. Yeah. All right. We'll that. All right. So let's get back. Any other? Uh, what other pictures do we got from Rescue Five as a lieutenant? Oh my gosh! Before we get into, uh, I'm not sure. I can't tell you about which because he had another there. lucky yeah. stroke. Uh, another stroke of luck by getting back there as captain. I don't know how that happened either. Hank, well, but I, I, will you, I, I will show you. I will say this is one that we need to see because this is my worst nightmare. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, what's going on here? Okay, so I'm pretty sure I was a captain for this one. But, yeah, we would dive under ice. Uh, I, I've dove under ice a couple times now. First time I did it was at night. And, you know, hey, Hank, you know this, right? When you dive, you know, you never lock the you never lock the beaner, right, so you can get out, right? Correct. After I dove that night under ice, I came out and I said – We'll put two beaners on it. We're locking both of them when we're going on the ice. <laughs> I I was I was like this up against the ice, going long right, and I think I've gone like I don't know, hundred, two hundred feet maybe. I come back out and I go, well, you might have made fifty. I'm like, ah. really, it's that it's that it's that disorienting. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And, yeah. Also, I guess for for those of us who are uninitiated, right? So. Uh, it's a dry suit you're wearing, but you feel the cold, right? I mean, it's not. Well, you, you wear a thermal suit. There's a thermal. Under, there's there's, right, there's right. underwear underneath it. There's like a thermal underwear. Yeah, it's cold, but yeah. it's still, it's still freaking cold. cold. Yes. It's yeah. still cold. Yeah. yeah. And is there any lighting that you have that helps you out at all, or no? Under ice, you have the you have the, the light in your hand, right. but it it's not really <laughs> it's not really reflecting well, and uh. <clears throat> During the day, it's uh, it's pretty much the same thing. You you really need to have an idea of where you're cutting your hole and where your objective is, where you're heading, because uh, it you you really kind of uh, it's when you're on that. You can't tell what, so what direction different. you're going. In. Is, is there any kind of like a like so like a lot of divers will have like a board with like a compass on it that kind of tell you where to go and kind of directional is does it work like that with the fdmy diving or yeah you had right you had the console but yeah it's on the console yeah okay but i don't know but i mean john you know cat maybe you could confirm or, or disagree but I, I know myself um out of all the responsibilities and, and and you know of things that we were trained in and had to do um you know some some of the dive jobs weren't that intimidating you know 30, 40 feet, and, and you were kind of in open water or, or, or off a pier, um, even though it was pretty much black water diving, where, you know, wherever we went. But there was, I would say the times that I was most um, uncomfortable was was some of the dive uh, jobs that we, you know, had to respond to. You know, um, like you say, uh, um, I don't think we had too many actual jobs under the ice, but training, you know, having to do that training just in yeah. case, uh, you know, it doesn't give you a warm, fuzzy feeling. No. Um, the one I talked to you before, that the commercial diver that was trapped off of Staten Island where right. the guys from five got him and myself and Ray were the, uh, in one as the safety divers, you know, driving in, you know, on the radio and you're getting all these reports and you're saying to yourself, this guy's a commercial diver who spends his life on the water and he's trapped and now we're going – to rescue this guy, you know, and I didn't never really, I mean, you did it, you know, you did what you had to do, but it was never like, you know, like, wow, I'm really feeling comfortable about this. So, uh, you know, that, that particular stuff, I don't know if you felt the same way, Cap, but I know oh, for me, going did it, but the ice was, 
totally different yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah i hear you and and then you know what i, I noticed though in, in the time that i was at five between the lieutenant and the captain the 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 water around staten island because of all the the, the, the the sewer treatment plants finally coming online and really working the last time i dove under like the varizano uh, uh to the stanchions i must have had 20 feet visibility easy and I, when I first did that dive yeah. years earlier, it was just, it was just murky. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. there's another, uh, there's another uh, photo that I wanted to ask you. Maybe you could explain what's going on with this drilling. It's the uh, lake drill photos. Uh, what's happening here? What were you doing? What were you doing here? Oh, uh, during the summer, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd have a, a, a kind of like a standby drill to do, uh, and this is one of them. So what we would do is we would leave Rescue 5, and we would say, okay, we just got a call. <clears throat> Silver Lake had had, had drownings fairly regularly. Uh, uh, so the kids would go and drink and uh, go for a swim and and die. So we, we, had, uh, we wanted to get our drill down so that we would leave, and the expectation is when we got to the drill site, we'd back down like we normally would, get to the bridge, Put the diver in. So the, the whole thing was to get the guy ready, dressed, just to be comfortable getting somebody fully dressed and ready to go in the water. When we got there, we usually took like a six-foot hook, threw it out into the lake, and then had him go get it. But uh, yeah, this is one. This is one of those drills on one of those days where we would just you know go down to the go down to the uh, Silver Lake Reservoir and. Uh, it's like another cold day. It's like a winter day there. Right. You, you uh, just answered my question. It might have been say. fall. It might have been fall. Silver and Silver Lake was a reservoir, right? That was yes. Staten Island with you know drinking water. And <laughs> it was the drinking water reservoir for years, mm -hmm. and what they did was uh, there's a hill alongside this now, a man-made hill, and inside there is actually like a something like some 10 million gallon uh, reservoir that they built, and where is actually the, the water that people drink come from on Staten Island. So I gotta ask this. So you know, obviously we know the rescue. Uh, you boys in the rescue do everything that it's not just, you know, firefighting. Right. So this is actually also for any of you guys uh, who've done diving, you know, like um, what, what is it like you go in as a firefighter, you have this idea, you're going to be putting water on the fire and now all of a sudden you're diving. Right. Is it just like, all right, it's a part of the job or did you take it and go, all right, you know, I'm going to be great at this. And did you've kind of fall? Did you have to fall in love with it to get good at it, um, a little bit? What diving, Pete? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, diving because you, know, it's yeah. not it's not like regular firefighting. And I know you guys <laughs> love kicking the goddamn door down and and putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. You know what I mean? That's the essence of what you guys do. But this is for either senior dude or 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 uh, Captain Ferry. You, did you guys have to kind of like fall in love with diving a little bit to kind of get good at it? Or is it just something that you just did regularly drilled on and you moved on? You know, I, I think it's a combination. Okay. Of what you're saying. Uh, and, and I think it goes more like this. So when I got the orders to go UFO to rescue five, I was in the first division and one of the senior lieutenants, uh, we went out for a drink. It was going to be my last uh, day tour. We went out for a drink afterwards. And he said to me, why do you want to go there? Why do you want to do this? And I said, listen, I just care about being able to get someplace and help somebody. And if I can do more of that in the rescue, mm. that's what I want to do. Mm. He said, okay, fair enough. And I think what, mm. what comes out of that is whether you're learning how to do oxy-settling work or you're learning how to dive, you're doing high angle, you're doing confined space, uh, new, new kind of Hirsch tools come out. Whatever it is, is all part of that helping people, and you just you 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 buy into it because it's 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 an opportunity to do something, right? And I, I know myself, like when I was interviewing to go to Rescue One, um, that's when the dive program was coming online, and um, you had to you know they had to make sure that they had X amount of divers, yeah. you know, because every tour you had to have at least two certified divers. Uh, cause you had to have your primary and your backup, you know, and then the other guys were trained as tenders. Sometimes you had everybody as divers, but like I know myself, the captain said, well, to get here, you got to go on your own and get open water one. And I remember myself and, and Timmy Higgins was also on 132. He wanted to go to rescue two and the two of us were in Freeport 
you know, we took our we took our diving together. We did open water one, and um, you know, actually, uh, we did some diving off of, over by you, Kev, off of Long Beach. You know, for that to get our wow. uh, off the jetties and stuff to get yeah, uh, yeah, and and in Rockaway. <clears throat> so you you had a you know you had to be certified. Now I don't know how it is now to get into a rescue, but I would imagine diving still part of the program. They have to have X amount of divers, right. so they may require it. Like right. with one, you know, there was a lot of senior guys there. Um, you know, they didn't like make them grandfather. If they wanted to dive, they let them go through the dive training. But from that point, it was like, okay, now you new guys, you want to come in, you all got to be certified <laughs> to open water one, and then we'll take you to open water two. Um, rapid deployment, search and rescue, and blackwater diver, and those were the other three certifications you had. You know, you got once you were in the company. So I like, yeah. I like. Uh, but, you know, I, to, I guess to answer your question, I guess I kind of said it before, Pete. It was, yeah. It, you know, I mean, I listen. I, I did enjoy it, and I, and I, I was fairly good at it. But like I said, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't like second nature, like firefighting or or the hearse tool, or even when even with the high angle ropes with you know the knots yeah. and the anchor points. It was just you. You weren't in. Uh, you know, there was no window to jump out when you're 40 feet down or something, and, and you know you're having a problem with the regulator or you get tangled. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just. A, it was never a really comfortable feeling. You yeah. did it. You did it. It was part of your duties. No one else was coming, so you had to do it. But it was just never, never like. All right, I really feel good at this. I, I love that. I love your guys' answers. Basically, it's like whatever I have to do to save save a life and help people that need me, and uh, that just speaks to the uh, to the essence of what the fire department is and the fire services. Yeah. So I really respect and love that answer. I've I've heard a lot of guys on the show from rescue say, you know, it wasn't their favorite thing, but it was a necessary evil to be in the rescues. I mean, it might have been not might have not been their favorite thing to do, but. If you wanted to be in a rescue, you did it, and you did it as well as you could, right? I mean, it's part of being in a rescue, so. Right. Just like anything, though, you know, some guys, remember, Hank, when we got the 288, some of the younger guys who learned it in other places, the ropes, they had 52 different ways to do shit, and you were like, this way works. It's really simple. You don't have to get that fancy. But some guys like that. Some guys were into the ropes, and they, they could do, you know, all these different uh, setups and – right. You know, it, it all depends on what you like to do. As long as you were proficient at doing it when you were asked to do it, you may not have liked it as most, but, you know, you did it. Yeah. And like I say, you know, and, and every rescue company and every – I mean, and even, you know, regular line companies, like you say, there's guys that have backgrounds from military or, you know, like two of the senior guys in one had been Navy demolitions divers. So, you know, those guys were – it was like, you know, they went in war. It was nothing to them. You know, it was like, okay – and you know, if you wanted to learn, you followed their lead, and you know, and you ask questions, and that's that's the, you know the way the fire service works. But yes, you naturally, if that's one of your duties, you want to try to excel and be the best that you can be at it. And that's you know, right? I mean, right, Cap, you agree, yeah. especially with the kind of guys we work with, yeah. you know. And that that doesn't go just for SOC. That goes for the busy fire companies, guys. You know, they were in busy companies because they wanted to be in busy companies and they wanted to be the best at what they did. Yep. Hey Hank, you do you remember a guy named John Forster? He was he was in the dive class with you. Okay. You mean what? Oh, you mean with school, uh, with the rescue five? Right. So John I, Forster I, came out of a one thirty one truck, right? Okay. He's like senior guy there, and John Forster became a diver, and John Forster couldn't swim. <laughs> really. <laughs> 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 well, so he's talking about guys with determination, like, yeah, I'll do this, watch me. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I, I know guys who joined the Navy and didn't know how to swim, uh, which oh. is, you know, I mean, that's a little oxymoronic, but, uh, I, yeah, that's that's wild. Hey. <laughs> oh, do I have to pour another? I might have to. It wasn't uh, semen stains, was it? <laughs> <laughs> That's never gonna get old, bro. It's never old. <laughs> I told you like the story. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you held that for a while. I've had you on the show eighty two times. Now you bust that one out, bro. Yeah, well, you know, got, you gotta keep a little in your back pocket. You know, I I, I totally understand. But, well, I many see guys in the, in, in, the, in the chat saying they're seeing too much of me, so I don't want you know I don't want to be yeah. yesterday. Who's saying no, that? No, 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 no. I saw that earlier. That's Ray know? busting balls over oh, here. Ray, no, no, I wasn't Ray. It was some. Somebody else, I don't uh, remember. In the beginning, can, so, yeah. you know what they can do? Suck it. That's what hey. I'm <laughs> you know, we'll just, All right, uh, so we'll just for the guys bullshitting about uh, Hank. You 
dick. <laughs> Fuck you. What was that, Pete? You I didn't hear that. What? <laughs> you dick. <laughs> you know, when they say oh, stuff like man. that, when they say stuff like that in the chat, you know what it sounds like to me, Pete? You know. What's that? You know what it sounds bra, bra, like. Bra, bra, bra. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so I'm going to ask this. Gonna, we we protect our own over here, That's especially right. our senior dude. Right. right. Thank you. But let the, let right. the captain go on. I want to I hear about later on. I got questions about Scottsdale. So you're not even. We're not All even right. Even. I'm going to get that. I got to know, though. Like, I don't really know the answer, but he gets, he gets promoted captain. Let me see how this works, Hank. So he gets promoted in March of 94. Covering in Division 13. And then September of 94, poof, he's the captain of Rescue 5 again. Mm. How, how does that work? <laughs> let him, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to say, how to, let him tell the story. Hey, listen, he must, have, he, he must have excelled through his whole career, and that's why he is got what it is? I, I didn't exactly. know. Well, let the man tell his story. How does that happen, Cap? Uh, you... <laughs> so... Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, okay? All but right. I'll tell you this part of it, all right? I'll tell you, and Hank will appreciate this. So there's a guy named, firefighter named Tom Print. okay? It's Tom Print. he's in squad one, goes to rescue four, goes to rescue one. He gets promoted to lieutenant, goes to rescue five, transfers to rescue three. He's on the captain's list. And he tells everybody, I will be the next captain of Rescue 2. Without hmm. without hesitation. The, the, did he not do all those things, Hank? Yeah. Yes, you know. He did all those things. <laughs> right. So okay. when I wanted that spot, I called Tom Prynne and said, hey, Tom, I need a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Prynne gave me the plan. Okay. And I guess, I guess it worked because you were yes, back in, it, six months to the day, it says, right? Yep. yep. Because uh, back uh, then, on the regs, it was six months to the day you could go back. That's a name I haven't heard in a while, Tom Prynne. Look, you oh, made Hank smile twice tonight. <laughs> hey! Holy shit. <laughs> wow. We uh -huh. got to have him back on the show. He makes Hank smile. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Well, like I said, like like MC said, it's, it's like a stroll down memory lane, you know? Yeah. We, we remember we were actually part of something that, that was important, you know? Yeah, this said when we had the other guy out from 132, he had a good time too, right? Um, his name escaped Piccone. Me. Greg. Yes, Greg Piccone. He was a little yeah. strut, a little struck down memory lane for you. That's right. This is what I've been meaning to ask you. So you get there in 94, in 2000, you get lifted. We have uh, we were a little familiar with guys getting lifted, like Ruffy. That was for finger poke and a deputy chief. But we, you'll let, we'll let you tell us the story of how you got lifted. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> okay, so I'm going to give you like a really condensed version. Okay. Okay. The, the Reader's okay. Digest version. <laughs> yeah, because, it, it, because to give you all the background to how it happened would be like I'd have to tell you an entire another person's family tree. Okay. All right. So, so basically, a deputy chief and I have had different run-ins. Okay. Yeah. Mm. In the, before he be, before he's a deputy chief, and now that he is a deputy chief, okay, and I felt that uh, his father, who was uh, a borough commander one time on Staten Island, uh, ding, 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 ding. I think had a lot to do <laughs> with uh, what happened because I think uh -huh. he was taking some direct direction, and uh, mm. my lifting uh, came over the because I couldn't get from. He sent Rescue 5 to the second floor of a, a, a dwelling fire that was out. And then when we all got up there, he sent two more companies up and then told me to go check the electric work. So mm. that the, there was a line down. So I didn't respond to him fast mm. enough and and did give him enough deference to his orders. I got lifted. So he had a hidden agenda. He was trying to set you up and wait, just wait. It's, for... uh, it's a really long story. Yeah. But uh -huh. I, I live with this. I did the right thing every time, so I'm okay. They, so. I like that. We might not say that about our, our uh, empty seat that uh, is away hunting right now. We can't uh -huh. say that. <laughs> there might have been some, but he did the right thing for the guys. I'll say that. Yes. Did you uh, did you turn around ever, allegedly, at any point and say, you 
dick <laughs> to the uh, to the uh, chief. I'm just, I'm sure no. you no. did. You, no, did you think not. that? No, that. Yeah, you, did you not. did you think no. you dick? <laughs> no. I, I know who he's talking about. That would not went. That wouldn't have went over really well. That would have went over like a fart in church or something. Right. Ouch, you know, forget ouch, it. ouch! 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 All right, so you. Uh, you're out of there for about what? Uh, oh, so from October and September 11th, you returned. A little over a year. Yeah, a little over a year. How did that work? How did you come back? What? What? Uh, the, uh, what 9 11 was... happened, and mm -hmm. Pete Hayden, I was back in the first division. Pete Hayden said to me, John, great just, guy, by the way. Yeah. John, go do what you got to do with five. Really? Yeah. And you just, and he took the, did he have, to, now, how does it work? Does he have to clear that with the chief who lifted you? Or okay, does so, he just override? Well, he became chief of department. So. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Done. So hold on. What right. happened is, no, he didn't be, that guy didn't become the chief of department. Oh. Pete Hayden didn't become Pete. Oh, yes, he did. I'm sorry. Pete Hayden did. Yes. I yeah. thought he meant somebody else. I'm sorry. No, no, the no, other no, guy no. didn't. So Pete Hayden's in charge of the first division. So he's in charge of me. So he mm -hmm. says, John, do what you got to do. So I go back to five, and I just operate as the captain for about two, three weeks. And I get a phone call saying, hey, you know, you're not in sock anymore. You got to go back to the first division. But, okay. I hang up the phone. And I say that to uh, Nat DePrisco had retired already. And he'd come back, and he was running the office. He would, Monday to, like Monday to Friday, he came in and ran the office for us while we did everything else. While we kept people at the, you know, the pile. We kept guys taking care of the families. We kept guys, some guys go home. We had to keep guys on the truck too. So through all of that, uh, Nat came back and he ran my office for six months. And I say he ran my office for six months because when I left, I was outside in my car sitting there saying, okay, let me get my shit together. Let me do this. Let me do that. And he comes down and he says to me, I just talked to Cassano. You're staying. So I went back upstairs and I stayed until, uh, Uh, the plaque dedication, and no one came to me and said the order actually opened. I, w I, w I wasn't on the order, okay? I was just there, UFO. I was still assigned to the first division, and nobody came and said I could have the spot and stay. Uh, I don't think that was going to happen. I mm -hmm. made an inquiry about whether I could go to OEM, and they said that would be like a promotion for you guy like you, and I said, okay. And really? Bobby Ingram uh, took me in. And hazmat operations, and I did my, my last time, last year and a half, the two years, uh, in in uh, hazmat operations, and it turned out to be uh, a blessing in disguise for me. I I I had, I had done a training stint years earlier as a captain at five, so I went offline for like three months to teach a class, and it went from like two months to like three and a half months, and the first week I was kind of like not coming home in a good mood. So my wife said to me, hey, you said this was going to be a good thing for your career to say you were an instructor and this and that, and you're coming home, you know. So I, I changed my attitude, finished what I had to do. But when I went back the second time to Hazmat Operations, when Bobby brought me back, I went with a wholly, totally different attitude. I went with, like, I'm going to make something happen here. And Bobby gave me a lot of things to do. I got to be the liaison from Hazmat with uh, the gas company, uh, M MTA, the cops. Uh, mm. I said I have some massive drills. Uh, I, I got to do a lot of really good things before I left, so I was Excellent. very happy that I went there. Excellent. Yeah, you might have know. How, so you were in ops, right? You know, might have know my wife. She was selling the gas meters to Hazmat Ops. She was uh, working for Guardline MSA, and then she worked for uh, BW Technology, the yellow meters. Yeah, Asian chick, not too, not too hot on the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> she was I, in ops all the time, man. She probably knows. Yeah. Yeah. I probably met her. I, I, I just don't remember right now. Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, Mikey Milner wants you to tell the story about Ray Downey in Oklahoma. I don't know what that means. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna jump in. Hey, thanks. Well. We worked the night shift because we're from New York. So we worked the night shift in here and we worked as a blitz. So normally the, the, the task force is supposed to work 12 hour shifts. So you split your team in half, half work, and then you relieve each other. So you work a 24 hour cycle. But when we got to Oklahoma, they said, no, you guys are all going to stay together and you're just going to go in at night. So we went in around eight o'clock at night and we left at like eight o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. So, 
but Ray worked the day shift. <laughs> so he'd, he'd read instructions, and by the time, you know, it got to us at 8 o'clock, yeah, we kind of just kind of adjusted things. And got <laughs> on the fly. On the fly. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting time there, too. A lot, lot of... Uh, a lot of really unique things happened there. Uh, everything from Geraldo Rivera sneaking in to, you know, yeah. <laughs> no shit. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I worked with him for – Pete's uh, buddies with Geraldo. Yeah, for the last 12 years. He got my he got me and my wife really drunk one night at his house, but I'll tell that story another time. Oh, really? He's a, oh, wow. he's a fun guy. He's all right, oh, man. <clears throat> really? Yeah. You haven't yeah, seen yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you ask Geraldo, does he remember Maria Moldar? Oh, I'll ask. I'll ask him next time I uh, see him. When I'm, uh, Maria Moldar. He interviewed Maria Moldar. Was that like Midnight at the Oasis or something? Yes. <laughs> when they did the interview, they were in her, they were in her boudoir on her bed, Ooh. and they were rocked. They were gone. Really? That's why I just asked Pete if he was in that same situation. He gave me this. Like, maybe it did happen. No, 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 no. That's not how things panned out. I'm just asking, you know. I don't know. I'll tell you this, that guy has, uh, he's, he's uh, claimed more notches on his belt than anybody else that I've ever even heard. Uh, of. Allegedly. So, we don't allegedly. Want to that out there. Yeah. That's alleged. No, 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 no. He's never given me, I, I can just tell you right now that I could, I could smell it. I mean, you know. It can, all right, listen, so this will be our last show because we're all going to sue us now. Thank you very much, Pete. <laughs> well, I, I don't, he's never told me. Oh, I'm all right. Saying that. I'm not that's saying when that. he was porn producer, Pete. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's yeah, that's bow chicka wow wow, Pete. G Man is one of the coolest dudes I've ever worked with. Worked with him for many years on a syndicated uh, show. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank oh, you. Oh, what, did we just have uh, what John O'Connell was he in in Oklahoma too? We just had him on. He was showing us pictures yes, of all the. Yeah, he was right. Yeah. He he said, goes, he if he anyone was, doesn't was, believe me, of... this is recent, right here. So, uh, oh, look at you! Oh, we nice. were out with uh, we were out shooting an interview about uh, whatever it was, but he still has the best stash in the game. So there, yeah. Is. Where's his other hand? I don't see. It. <laughs> <laughs> He's working me like a puppet, you son yeah. of a bitch. Hey, what's with that picture? You look like a Mardi Gras head. Oh, yeah. I don't know what we're doing. It was very windy that day. Very windy that day. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh. Joseph Schneiderman, Schneiderman says, tell Captain Ferry I said hello. Wow. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. All righty. Yeah. All right. So this is the part the that we, Hank wanted to get to. After hazmat operations, you retire after 25 years in 2004. Now you're a consultant for the FDNY for a year. What are you, as far as what, hazmat or what are you consulting on? So I got to be the liaison for like eight or nine different agencies. Mm -hmm. So I came back and I kind of like trained guys to do the same thing. And at the same time, I was, I was working on some of the larger exercises. And that's when, uh, that's when they had just, when I retired, like, that's just when they opened the center for terrorism and disaster preparedness. So I was working out of there hmm. and I, I was fortunate. I had a, I had a small desk in, at headquarters <laughs> and I had a, I had an office out there. Did you do, did you set up the drill? I think it was at Chase Stadium at the time. Oh they had yeah. The, uh, you did that one? I, we went to that one. That was good drill. Yeah. The the, 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 the huge blocks of uh, uh, foam, uh, the styrofoam. Yeah. We, we tell people, okay, that weighs 15,000 pounds. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah but I, yeah. I, they had a secondary device, I think, in one of the food courts or some shit. I don't know. They had something going on with that, too. That was another one. All right. So after that, I like this part, man. You, you – you, uh, 2005, you finish that consultant, and you go out to Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, and you become a captain on the Scottsdale, Arizona Fire Department in 2005. Yes. So, so how did that happen? They called you. They saw you. You applied. How, how did that work? Two different people in the in, in the FDNY told me about it, and this is what happened. There used to be a contract company here, and they still exist in the United States. It's called Royal Metro. So Royal Metro supplied the firefighters for the Scottsdale Fire Department, but the city owned the buildings and the city owned the fire trucks, but they didn't own any of the equipment on the fire trucks and they didn't own the, the firefighters, so to speak. Hmm. So the they the Royal Metro firefighters 
organized, they became a union, and they were fighting to become a <coughs> municipal fire department. And they got it on the ballot, and they lost. They lost like like 60-40. And what happens is a year later, like in 2004, Rural Metro says, but we're out of here. We're not renewing our contract. So now the city's forced to build a municipal fire department. For years, they relied on Rural Metro. So thank God they hire 180 guys from Rural Metro because they know where everything is. Yeah, um, otherwise. Yeah, they know where everything is. Thank <laughs> yeah. God they hired them. And they hired pretty much chiefs from everywhere. Okay? They brought fire chiefs in from everywhere. And that was really dysfunctional. Okay? Just to say it slightly. Because everybody's building their own little empire at headquarters, right? I guess that everybody does things differently depending on what part of the country you're from, too, no? Well, they, they actually brought the majority of all those chiefs came from different departments here in Arizona. They didn't come from oh, all okay. the country. All right. Okay. So they knew the system, but they were still trying to, you know, jockey for their spots, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So they hired me. And the, the program was phase two. They hired the Royal Metro guys in phase one, phase two. I got hired as a captain. I sent them a resume. Uh, I had to fly out here a couple times, and I got lucky. They picked me up as a captain. Uh, in in all fairness, I got to, just because I'm one of those guys. I got to disclose uh, my last three years, my well, no, last thirty two months, I was a firefighter. Yes, I got demoted. So. Yeah, he's laughing. I can see his face. Yeah, I know. Can't stop. Lifted, lifted, demoted. Yeah. 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 Uh oh, he's frozen. Is he frozen? Oh, no. He's frozen. The truth is that out here, your pension's based on your high three years, not your last three years. And I knew that everybody was going to start retiring at 15 years. Because they 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 so they bought some time back. I thought the fifteen year mark was going to be a big drop, so I did all my overtime up front. And locked it in. Locked it in. So when I left, I left okay. Oh, good for you. Now, what did you work on? Did they uh, a truck, uh, an engine? What? How did they uh, work it out engine. there? I uh, I was on an engine here. Uh, I was on the hazmat engine for several years, and. Uh -huh. I, I never I never went to a ladder here, and the reason is the ladders here are somewhat different. Yeah, that, okay. that was one of my questions because I, I have you know between where, where you ended up and FDNY, you know, um, what, what's the difference in manning riding positions? And I know a lot of places in the country truck work is not like it is in New York City, so I didn't know how it was by you. Two different animals, totally, totally two different animals. Okay, the truck work. Uh, Manning is four four person, four person total. We got an officer. That includes the driver, officer, the driver. Four people, all four. Okay, so, so that's the Manning. Uh, you I mean, first through second through floor above that kind of stuff, or, but you know, no, no, okay, no, okay. So when I explain to them that like our first alarm assignment is totally defined. By what type of building it is, whether you're first, second, or third, or first or second truck, it's all defined. Whatever the building is, we the guys know where they're going, what they're supposed to do. Backup line goes here, second, first line goes there. Fires on the third floor, I do this, you do that. Same thing with the truck positions here in New York. Out there, it kind of goes more like this. Engine one on the scene. Uh, go engine one. Okay, engine one, I'm on the scene of a one-story a residential structure, smoke showing from the east. I'll be uh, stretching a hand line for search, rescue, fire control. I'll be uh, taking a water supply from the south end. I'll take command. Mole can will be mobile. Uh, this this will be uh, 68th Street Command. Okay. All that's going to happen before he gets off the truck. Okay. <laughs> I'm asleep already. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but he's I doing understand. everything, man. He's doing everything, that guy. Oh. Wow. So, so they get a hydrant. They stretch down. They, they do a lot of uh, uh, inline pumping here if they, if they have to pump the hydrant. Okay? So there's a lot of inline pumping goes on because they hook the hydrant with a hemet valve, and then they go, they go into the scene. 
So a Hemet valve is like a, a valve that automatically goes on. So if you need to ha- pump the hydrant, next engine comes in, connects two short connections, flips the valve, and they can pump the hydrant and supply you with more pressure. Okay. The so every position after that, whether you're the ladder, the engine, you, you'll call command, okay, and you'll ask command what you want. And command, if you're the second to engine command, why don't you come forward, take a line off my truck, come in and join me at search, rescue, fire control on the inside, and then you'll repeat that back to him. Okay, so, uh, engine two copies. I'm going to take a line off your truck. I'm going to come in and help you with search, rescue, fire control. The chief will get there and the chief say, okay, uh, command to, to I copy all your reports. Uh, or he'll say, tell me your reports. He'll tell, command will tell him everything he's done. And then he'll say, okay, I got it. And then he'll sign like, okay, ladder, I want you to come in. I want you to vent the roof from the east side. I want you to do this. Yeah, so everything oh, is, everything. Anybody, think, is anybody figure for themselves or is everything just uh mapped out uh, told what to do like you're going to do this you do this you do that i guess it's what you said but they, we already know what our positions they, and what they we're call doing it the order model they call it the order model so every order you get yeah. you repeat it back really yes and it i'm going to like tell there's you, a lot a lot of time goes by that was yeah. that was something ray downey said to me when i when i made lieutenant i, I talked to a couple i talked to vigiano and i talked to him and ray downey said to me remember Whatever that off, chief officer tells you to do, you repeat it back to him. So he hears it, his own voice coming back at him. So later on, he doesn't say to you, hey, what did you go do? So that was one thing Ray said to me. Like, oh, ah, whenever you get an order by a chief, you repeat it back to him. Ah, that right there is an old school tip of the day. I like it. And, and Vigiano's, Vigiano's advice to me, because I hadn't been in a rescue company, was like, hey, just tell the guys, hey, I got some good fire experience. I'm here. Pick up the tools. We'll work together. I'm here to support everybody. Any anybody gets he says anybody gets jammed up, you come to me. I'll take care of it. Wow, and that's what I said first day oh. I walked in. It's a lot different out yeah. there in Scottsdale, Arizona, huh? Hey, but the right. truck, so, so cap the trucks are, are pretty much not used as like like the New York City ladder. They don't do, they don't do search and rescue. Okay. Oh, they, well, they, you just bet the first guy comes in. He's stretching a line. He's doing search. He's doing right. Is that what you said? Like the first, right. the first, yeah, my first engine, yeah. So the second dude truck on his way there. The guy's like, "Yeah, hey, stop at Starbucks. Put me up oh, a latte." No, no, and then no, 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 no. <laughs> I was the first two engine. Uh, first yeah, no. Truck is going to go to the roof and cut the That's cut it. a hole. That's the they, whole. They're not doing forcible entry. No, they're not finding the seat of the fire. No, not going to the roof. Oh, wow. Yes, they no. go to the roof. That's that's, that's, so that's primary it. thing is ventilation. Oh, all right. Do uh, did you but catch they, any? They, they're going to the roof of peaked roofs, correct? Well, because we have that discussion. You know, that's oh, like a never ending thing. So, oh boy, depends on what. Okay, the, the fire field here, so to speak, is twenty six cities. They're all on automatic aid, so you can go from Phoenix to Scottsdale, base it at Scottsdale. <laughs> It's 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 automatic the eight okay for the call volume. When you talk about you know automatically going to the roof, uh, yes and no. If it's a tile roof in certain cities, they don't want you to go into the roof. It's a tile roof. In Scottsdale, you can go to the roof even if it's a tile roof. So it it actually comes down to like some well, yeah. Issues. Sure. Yeah. Right. You, can, you, can, you don't have to answer this because you know you don't have to like throw anybody under the bus. But you had 25 years with New York City, you had 15 years with Scottsdale. Did you feel more comfortable operating in one place than the other, or was it equally comfortable or equally uncomfortable? Or no answer. To, to I'm going to say this, okay? Because I'm always going to try to look at the brightest part I can. The kitchen tables are the same. I was just going to ask you that. Holy okay. shit. I was going to ask tables. you if the kitchen table is universal. The kitchen table is universal. And I told those guys that. Listen, this is what you're going to miss the most. You're going to miss. They don't see a lot of fire activity here because everything is. is, is New uh, and play. It's new. <laughs> it's it's sprinklered. Everything in Scottsdale is sprinklered. Residential homes are sprinklered here. Yeah. So that's yeah. so funny. I was just gonna ask you that. How does the kitchen table translate to the rest the of the country? The kitchen table is the same. 
the, the flyer activity, I, I had to relearn some stuff. I even took a couple college courses that they offer out here. So, so you know, uh -huh. classes, so it's to kind of, you know, catch up with how they do things. <clears throat> yeah. mm -hmm. That's why we're so popular, Hank, because we bring the kitchen table to you. Bingo. Thank you. And that's where the shirt comes in. Hey. Same circus, different clowns. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. do have that oh, shirt at uh, getsaltyapparel.com if you want to check that out. We do have that. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay, a, so diplomatic, a diplomatic uh, answer. I appreciate it. I'm going to read between the lines because I'm a little bit biased, but that's quite all right. Mikey Milner <laughs> wants you to mention your involvement with the Hall of Flame. So, uh, I'm the I'm I'm the vice president of the Phoenix Division retirees out here, mm -hmm. and we have a relationship with the Hall of Flame. So, the Hall of Flame is a firefighting museum here. And it was originally started in Chicago by the Getz family, and this is a family you don't know by that name, but they are billionaires. Okay, and this is. This is the largest collection under roof of fire apparatus in the world. They have like four galleries. They have a warehouse where they can store 50 trucks. Oh. Uh, yeah, I heard it's the best firehouse museum possibly it's, in the world. Are it's, they it's, uh, interested in investing in a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed to come out there, Pete. Okay. The you did too. There you go. <laughs> You well, to I, I told John, yes, I told John again, they were doing it like this, that week of Indianapolis. So oh, yeah. I'm like, we couldn't swing it. It was like butt, buttered up weeks with Indianapolis. We just drove all the way out to Indianapolis, I told John, because they changed the date of that, right? It was originally supposed to be a different <laughs> date, and then they changed it from what I – Yeah, we did right? change it. Yeah. So we were originally supposed to come, and then they changed the date. And, you know, I don't want to say that, uh, you know, we like to make a little scud all at Indianapolis, but uh, – that's what happened. But I'd love to come out there. That'd be great to come out there, Pete. You know what I'm saying, Pete? Scott's still right, Arizona. I'm, I'm so all about Arizona. Let's do we, this. They, they, I usually go back east, but they do a ceremony for 9-11 at the Hall of Flame over the years. So we've grown this uh, uh, you know, relationship. And what happened was several years ago, Rescue 3, Rescue 4, and Rescue 5, they were sister trucks. They were bought on the same day. They went out of service on the same day. All three of those, all three of those trucks went to 9-11. When they went out of service, a group in Chicago uh, called the Remembrance Group, they bought four and five. And they made a deal with the guy who bought three because <laughs> all the doors from Rescue 4 mysteriously came off. Hmm. Hmm. That comes back later. Hold on. So okay. what happens is they get the doors, most of the doors from three, and they, they, they have four on the road. They paint the trucks back up again. They look look at them brand newish, so to speak, and they put them on the road, and they really didn't think enough about the logistics. Those things take a, a mile to a gallon, okay, mm -hmm. in fuel at that point in their careers. And those trucks, they, they basically bankrupted them, so to speak. So they had put money into them. And they sold them off. They sold Rescue 5 <coughs> to the Carl Beanie Foundation. Carl was the chauffeur, a chauffeur in Rescue 5. He died on 9-11. So his foundation bought Rescue 5's truck. Rescue 4's truck was bought by Alan. Ah, I just had his name. He's, he's a former member of the Sin House. He's retired. He lives in San Diego. He, he knew some of the guys from... Uh, the Remembrance Committee. So he buys <laughs> Rescue Four. Buys the, these rigs weren't cheap. They were thirty thousand dollars. He bought the truck and he donated it to the Hall of Flame. The Hall of Flame put it on display for about two months and then they decided we want to really fix it up. So they spent like a year and a half fixing it up. And in that time, I kind of got involved with planning the the rededication of the truck. So this past August eighteenth, we had a dedication. At the Hall of Flame, uh, we had about eight, nine guys from Rescue Rescue Four come out. Uh, it was uh, it was a really nice ceremony. Uh, the Dadell family came. It was uh, it was it was uh, the Brennan family came. It was really, really uh, uh, well well done. Uh, Terry, the Farrell family came too. Those are the three families I can remember. And 
we 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 gave them like a whole weekend here. We we gave them we took them to the Museum of the West the first night, and we gave them a uh, uh, just a, it's a great museum, Museum of the West. It's in Scottsdale. We gave them a little tour, gave them some food, gave them some drinks, uh, got everybody to see each other. A real short presentation. This is this person. This is that person. Everybody talk. The next night we did the actual uh, dedication of the truck, and then we went to a steakhouse after that, and it worked out really well for everybody, I believe. And then the next day we went to, uh, we have a, a, an old, old theater here, and that theater has been redone, and it looks like Radio City Music Hall, but just miniature, and it has a great sound system. So they played uh, a couple of, of movies for them, and it was it was a really great day. And before cool. that, we went to uh, uh, a bar that uh, uh, footed uh, breakfast for everybody. So it was really nice. Oh, very nice. Hey, there was those the rescue rigs that um, that had the uh, the seating, the four seating in the middle, and like the uh, the turbo was so loud, like it would blow you out the windows. Was that with those, those rigs? Yes, those are those are the rigs. Yeah, those are the rigs. Yeah, they were long rigs, man. But they were long. You were sitting rigs. there, I, I think you could go deaf, but the whistling of the turbo and that thing, man, it was crazy. Yeah, Thirty-eight feet. Uh, yeah, yeah, no but no, but no, the Richie Ford truck came out beautiful, it looks really good. And it's only the second truck from 9 11 to be in a museum. Three truck is the other one in New York, and now this is the, out west. We now have a, a truck where we can say, Hey, we have a piece of history here, and add to that whole thing of never forgetting. Uh, they have a the Hall of Flame has really stepped up with this, and they've really uh, they have a whole school district, every class coming to see it. Really, that's yeah. good, that's cool. Have you been back to uh, to New York to see the down to the museum at 9 11? Uh, I went, I went uh, with a, a, a friend of mine, Pastor Eric Olson. Uh, I went with him three years ago. Hmm. Have you been there yet, Hank? I've been to, I've been to the uh, uh, reflection pools. Uh, have, I, I was actually supposed to go, with, you know, the year of COVID. Um, right. It took me a while to, you know, I know it's going to be a pretty emotional day, but uh, yeah, I, I bring your uh, bring your hanky with you. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, you know, I'll never go again. It's, uh, yeah. and, and I know some of the, I know like some of the guys who were their gears in there. Or I know some of the guys. I know the radio transmission. So it's going to yeah. be. Um, yeah. It'll be tough, you know, mm. but yes, mm. I plan, uh, you know, I plan on getting there maybe this year. All right. Yeah, you know, the upcoming year. I told my wife that the only reason I'll ever go there ever again is uh, is to when I need to teach my kids about what happened that day. <clears throat> yep. And that's it. Mm. And that's, that'll be the only time. And that'll be the end. It's mm -hmm. a rough, if it's a, it's a really rough spot mm. to go to. <laughs> it is. But Pete, I think it's yeah. that time, my friend. You know what time it is. Oh, yeah, buddy. All right, what here we got? go, guys. What it's got? time for the old school tip of the day. Day, day. Take, Take the away, floor, Cap. Captain Ferry. Okay, so for me, it's, this is a two-parter, okay? First part is, in the fire service, we're given an immense amount of trust. Don't ever let go of that. Don't ever let go of that. People let us come in our homes. People let us help them. And they don't question anything about us. They don't want to know who we are. They don't want to know our names. They just want our help. Don't betray that trust ever. That's something we've earned over 100, 150, 200 years. Don't ever betray that trust. People trust us. Make sure you hold that shield of trust and hold everybody around you to that accountability of trust. The second part of this is drill. Oh, yeah, drill. Listen. You're only as good as the last time you touched your tool, okay? So don't be afraid to go out to that truck and get familiar because when you need something and you haven't touched it in six months, you're going to feel really stupid. There's no reason to feel stupid. Go out there, get familiar with everything on your truck. That way when you have to show up and be a pro, you're a pro. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Very right, great job. Excellent. So Hank, yeah. I think we're gonna do a double dip tonight. I think Hank had a, an old school tip of oh. the day. Well, oh. listen, I, I've been fortunate to be on numerous times, so I've, I've I'm I'm almost tipped out. And then plus with all the other great <laughs> guests, you know, they've 
they've covered them all. But this is just a small operational uh, tip. And the reason that it came to mind was because down here in Del Boca Vista, um, Captain Graham's, actually his next door neighbor on the Exposure 2 side, uh, had, had a, uh, a bad fire. The you know, neighbor had a bad fire in the garage. It's, it's attached to the house. And it was rip-roaring pretty good. Um, the Captain Graham was up, up north when it happened. And I think I was out on a golf course killing some worms when it happened. But I uh, came back and I rode by there. And just looking at the garage and with the, the door was half down and everything burnt out, kind of reminded me back in either the late 80s or early 90s. It was, and it, I'm pretty sure it happened on Long Island somewhere. Um, brothers had a, had a fire, again, a, a, in the garage, two-car garage attached to the house. And uh, they pulled up and the garage door was up. And the whole uh, inside of the garage was involved. And uh, they started moving in, knocking fire down. But uh, as they moved in a little further, um, I guess the fire had melted. It had an, the electric garage door opener and must have melted the wires. They made contact and it activated the door and the door actually closed with trapping them in the garage. Um, and you know, I don't know what happened if there was a problem with the water, with the with the garage. I, you know, I don't know all of the um, particulars, but I know that one of the guys got really severely burnt. So the, the only thing I can tell you is, um, when, you know, you pull up, uh, if you got a fire in the, in, in the garage, especially if it's attached to the house, you know, you're going to be uh, attacking it. Um, if the garage is up, you make sure that it's going to stay up, whether you put a hook in the door we should all be carrying a vice grip, and that's the, the, the best thing. You can, you know, vice grip the grip onto the channel of the garage door so it can't come down on you. Or, if, you know, uh, you carry a carriage bolt in your pocket because there's all the holes in the track you put the carriage bolt through. Um, just to prevent that door from coming down and trapping you, uh, and, you know, and maybe putting you in a precarious position. Um, and, and if the and even if the door's down, you know, if, if you raise it, you know, and assume that it has a garage door open or on, unless you know that it doesn't, and you still, you know, the springs could could uh, um, get heated and let go or the cables, garage could still come down. So if you're going to be operating there, just make that as you before you go in, you're in the, the truck or however your department does it, a positive means for keeping that door open so it can't close while you're <laughs> operating on it. That's it. Little tip of the day. Great hey. tips. We got a double oh, dipping on the tips tonight. Hey. Excellent. Beautiful. Cap, yeah, thank you. I learned. I actually learned a lot tonight on the show, right, Hank? We uncovered a lot of little good. Like I said, tonight. for me, it was a stroll down memory lane. Yeah, you, know, you, you got, got a you fabulous got a show. Lodges here, but it was great. Listen, you know? it, even Johnny Carson had a feeling, right? Yeah, so Rufy got a feeling. Hey, 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 hey Cap, you know, you know, what we didn't talk about. Uh, right by squad one, whenever it was, uh, uh, you know, a proby party, a promotion party at a Bombay bicycle club, right? Oh, you know, right bicycle. next door. <laughs> so that, that was oh, seen yeah. some crazy, some pretty wild fight at Bombay yeah, party. Right. That's for another night. <laughs> yes. All right. So, Petey, um, yes, sir. we got, uh, we put it out there last week. Uh, Worfie's gone again <clears throat> Monday night. He's off in uh, uh, Iowa or Idaho. Mm. I don't know what the hell he is. So we put it out there for guys to send in an email, starting off with the sentence, I should sit in Louis' seat because. So we got a whole bunch of them in. We will read them Monday night. But I have gone ahead and picked who I think should sit in Rufy's seat. And that will be. Wait, wait, wait. Should we you surprise got a drum roll? them? You got a drum roll? I no. don't. But should we surprise them? No. Okay. We'll put it. Uh, it will be Dan Wilson Jr. Dan Whoa! Wilson Jr. Okay. Dan Hold Wilson on. Jr. Get How's it coming in, Pete? Correct. There you <laughs> go, Dan Wilson Jr. And I got to say, Dan Wilson was there for the very first show in the chat. We had about 10 guys in the chat. And uh, Pete, he had, a, the, I think, maybe the very first question. And Pete said, here's Dan Wilson coming in shit hot. And <laughs> that's right. And then for years, I mean, he's been, how long are we doing this? Two years? Yeah, and then we met him at what show do we meet him at? Uh, Jersey. It was not Jersey. It was the big one upstate where we saw the crackhead smoking crack yeah. on the uh, was was it? It? Syrac yeah. Syracuse. Yeah, I thought it was whatever it was. I don't know. And for some reason, for the last two years, 
I was under the assumption that Dan Wilson Jr. was black. So when he came up to me <laughs> and he's a white dude, I'm like, you're Dan Wilson Jr.? Why I, thought, why I thought Dan Wilson Jr. was black, I have no idea. But he's a white dude. It doesn't really matter. But Dan Wilson will be sitting in Monday night for Lieutenant Refrano. And we will actually we'll read all the emails. They're pretty funny. And we'll do something else. We'll have some giveaways. And we'll have a good time on Monday night while Ruffy's out there shooting poor defenseless animals. And that's all I got. All right. Cap, any shout outs tonight, Cap? Would you like to take a shout out to anybody out there? I'd like to thank my wife because right now uh, we've had some adversities over the last few years, and she's been a stalwart, been next to me, keeping me, keep me, keep me golden. Excellent, beautiful. I like to hear that. Thank you, Mrs. Ferry. We appreciate you letting Captain Ferry have some time to come on with us tonight. What about you, uh, Hanky Mole? Anything for you? Actually. Uh... You know, my usual friends, Jersey and uh, <clears throat> North Carolina, you know, in Concord and Odell and uh, up in Fort Wayne. But most of all, uh, shout out to my son, Kyle. It's his birthday today. So happy oh. birthday, Kai. And I'll be, up birthday, New- Kyle. I'll be up in New York next week to see you. And Hank will take us out to lunch, Pete. Yeah. Excellent. So. <laughs> nice. I like that. I like the sound of that. I'm on yes, a fixed I'm income. Sure. I don't know if I can do that, Kev. So am I, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So am I. Darren, pay, uh, Darren, paycheck DeFries, paycheck. Darren DeFries in the chat is asking me to give out the shot to the four uh, high school students who were uh, killed mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Uh, and, you know, I, I there's definitely obviously going to be some um, fire service folks on the scene there who had helped out EMS and all that. But I just want to say one thing regarding that. Guys, expect to self-rescue always. Always try to be ready. Have a tourniquet on you. Have some wound packings. Have something um, somewhere. You know, um, it's the kind of world we live in now. Uh, I know it's a little somber note, but um, you know, to Darren's point, yeah, we can we can shout everybody out, but always expect to self rescue. Right. Um, I keep TQs on me always, so do it um, for you. If not for you, for the people that that are around you, your your wife, your kids, your family, your friends. That's it. That's all I want to say. I carry a pocket face piece still in my uh, car. I like that. All right. So uh, on Thursday the 9th, we have TK, Tommy, I don't say it's his last name, Kofner, Kofner, got out in 1968, uh, was a lieutenant 112, was a fireman in, I think, Engine 5. Is that Lower East Side, Hank? Engine 5? Engine 5. Or 15 oh. Engine 5? 15. 15. 14th Street. Uh, yeah, 14th yes. Street. That's, that's where Ronnie Geese started. There was, right. That's on like 14th Street. Yeah, they were rocking and rolling. I don't know what that is, Pete. What is that, a bong? What were you just showing me? That's our TQ. Oh, we carry right. that everywhere, North American Rescue. All Always right. have it. All right, so he got out in 1968. was Lieutenant 112. He's got some good stories. And I believe, I, I got to check with Ruffy, but the 16th, we have Mike Penner from Rescue 2 coming on on the 16th of December. Oh, very and good. That's, that's all I got for now. Cap, again, I had a Great show. I laughed. I learned a lot. I appreciate it. It'll give us a little insight to your career. Very much. And hopefully we make it out to Arizona. We'll come down to the uh, museum. We'll have a good time. We'll bring Milna. We'll have a, we'll have a whole bunch of laughs. Oh maybe even, out. We'll and maybe even John Gain. <laughs> Hanky <laughs> Mole and Milner in the same room. I'm, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Cap, right. Good seeing you tonight. It's been a while. Hank, really good to see you. Right. Stay, stay safe and uh, – Coobs and Pete and Louie, thank you for letting me sit in tonight. Uh, I enjoy it always. Thank you for coming in, brother. Weatherhead is. Be safe out there. Yeah. Ruffy made it out there safe. He sent us a text today. So he's out running around the woods somewhere. I don't know what he's doing, whatever he does. And uh, that's it. All right, Petey. Um, Uh, Yeah, and Captain Ferry, just hang hang with us. uh, Don't go anywhere, Cap. Until we cut the show, we'll we'll see you backstage in a moment. But everybody – you know, this is the part of the show where I tell you guys to go check us out on iTunes podcast, podcast, Spotify, or wherever fine audio podcasts are found. At this point, you know the deal. Like, subscribe, and share there. And if you're here on YouTube.com forward slash getting salty experience, hit the like, subscribe, and share button, dudes. I mean, it's simple as that. That's what gets us out there. You are our syndicators on uh, this great network. Uh, Instagram, guys, you find us at Salty Dog Inc., Mr. Rafano, curating those photos for you at 4.30 in the morning saying, Pete, wake up, wake up, Pete, wake up every day because 
I don't know why, because he's cold and he has no heat in his house and he has to break my balls. Uh, but anyway, that's that's part of it. Getting salty apparel.com, you guys. That's how we uh, pay the bills around here and also get you the coolest fire fighter apparel and accessories in the game. Uh, rep, rep the t-shirts. Uh, I, we had a guy, we had a couple guys with, with tattoos of our logo. We had the Bronx Ben tattoo. Yes. It was wild out there. It's wild out there. Um, so anyway. That's great. And uh, if you support us, uh, head on over to gettingsaltyapparel.com for a nice little Christmas gift there. Guys, thanks to everyone in the Super Chat tonight. As always, super generous. Really appreciate you all, guys. Uh, lots of love going out to all of our Super Chatters. Um, thank you for supporting us. Facebook, guys, uh, this is not our page, but a fan page, a legitimate fan page. There's 22,000 or so people in there right now, 21. Um, get in there. Lots of news about the fire service, fire topics of the day. You guys are hashing stuff out in there. No politics, of course, but wonderful discussion about fires and uh, what's going on in the uh, fire service. So get in there. Uh, last but not least, email us your questions at gettingsaltyexperience at gmail.com for our Q&As. Um, you know, let's get some more questions in there so we can deliver on those shows for you. Also, guys, all the Cup of Joe and Fuego stuff, the helmet cam footage, fire footage, rigs, tattoos, your uh, hottest old lady, not contest, but, you know, you want to show off your hot old lady in a bikini? We're not going to be mad at that. We're going to show everybody that. Oh, so, yeah. uh, by the way, the old ladies are blushing on their end and extremely happy, by the way, a lot like uh, Rob. Procaccini's wife, uh, who who is apparently thrilled and showed the segment off over on uh, on, on uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. Look at me, and I, I don't, who, who can blame her? Who right? wouldn't? Wrong? No, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Miss Procaccini. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, yesterday, you know, the other lady. So look, man, bring that heat. Bring it all in, man. Uh, we love yep. doing Cup of Joe. It's good, good fire news. And that, whew, my friends, is all. Wow, Pete, you did it. Look at you. You were like the producer extraordinaire tonight. I want to thank you so much, Pete. Great job. And don't forget Dan Wilson. I didn't see him in the chat tonight, but if you're watching this, uh, reach out to me on Instagram. I'll shoot you my – shoot it. Shoot the J. I'll shoot you my phone Who's number. Who's that? And, uh, whoa, who that? Who's this? Mrs. Ferry. No Get way. the hell out of here. Oh, Mamma mia. Send that picture over. Oh, send that <laughs> podcast. No I'll wonder you're you. smiling. <laughs> you. Yeah. Wow, I gotta give him a standing ovation. I gotta give him a standing ovation on that. Was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful. All right, guys, thank you so much. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, right there. All right, we'll see you uh, Monday night with this villain, Dan Wilson Jr., coming in shit hot. <laughs> All right, guys, remember what I said? I changed. Let's see how he does. I hope he doesn't clam up. You know what I mean? The bright lights. Up, but not clam up, and I get nervous. The bright lights oh. freak him out sometimes. You know how that oh, goes. Oh yeah. Yep. Get this All right, drinking. so I'll leave it. Uh, my, new, uh, my new uh, goodbye is remember, courage is colorblind, my friends. Until nice. next time. What do you got, Hank? All right. Say goodbye. Say goodbye, Hank. Goodbye, Hank. Good night, Leatherheaders. Be safe, and we'll see you on the flip-flop. All right, Ooh, stay flip -flop. low and go, and cheers, everybody.